I think this is the trouble for tri troubles with tribbles meeting. Live. Okay, we are live. Good morning. I'm Councillor Jennifer McKelvey. I'm the chair of the Infrastructure Environment Committee. The clerk has confirmed we have quorum, so I'd like to call meeting 20 to order. Today's meeting is being held by video conference. City staff are also connecting to the meeting by video conference. As City Hall remains closed, the public will continue to participate electronically and can watch the meeting streaming live on YouTube at youtube.com slash Toronto City Council live. The clerk staff have connected registered speakers to the meeting by audio. The list of speakers can be viewed online by visiting the Infrastructure and Environment Committee's page at toronto.ca slash council and clicking the speakers box for today's meeting. I ask for everyone's patience if we experience any delays or technical problems during the meeting. Members, the clerk has provided all meeting material on toronto.ca slash council and on CMP, the clerk's meeting portal. City's IT staff will be available to you remotely if you need help with your devices. I would like to remind staff to keep their mics muted and their videos turned off unless they need to answer questions or speak to the committee. This will make it easier for me as chair and for those watching on YouTube to observe members as they participate in the debate and vote on items. Members, please remember to keep your mic muted unless you wish to question staff or speak to an item and ensure that your video is on. As part of each agenda item, I will ask members to raise their hand or unmute their, mute, sorry, unmute their mic if they wish to question staff or speak. I will then create a speakers list and will call on members when it is their turn to speak. When voting on an item or motion, I ask that members ensure that they keep their video on and to raise their hand to indicate their vote. I want to remind you that you must still submit and approve your motions by email. Staff are available at IEC at Toronto.ca to help with motions. If there is any visiting members of council attending the meeting today, I see none right now, but I believe we'll have some later. Um, please turn on your video so that I know you are present and can give you the opportunity to ask questions of staff or speak. This will also assist the clerk staff to record attendance for the meeting. Although we are in different locations and meeting remotely today, the committee would like to acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Before we start today, I also want to point out that we are joined by Simran Hans and Aaron Myrdal of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. They are shadowing the staff in my office this week, and we thank them for joining us. Are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? If you have any interest, please raise your hand and unmute your mic. Uh, seeing none, we will proceed. May I have a motion to confirm the minutes of our meeting on January 11th, 2021? Councillor Pasternak, all those in favour, any opposed, that item carries. We have 17 items on our agenda and there are also new requests to introduce items. We will proceed with a review of the agenda, then we will consider adding the new business following that review. Our first item is IE 20.1 Amendment to Purchase Order Number 6031221 to Unit A Architecture Incorporated for Professional Services During Construction of the Process Control Building at Highland Creek Treatment Plant and Update Regarding Related Litigation. Would anybody like to hold the item? I'd like to move this item as it's in Ward 25. All those in favor? Any opposed? That item carries. IE 20.2, contract award of Ariba document number doc 2666-227009 to Maple, Render, Maple Reinders Construction Limited for rehabilitation and upgrades of seven pumping stations. Would anyone like to hold this item? I'll move it, Madam Chair. The item is moved by Councillor Pasternak. All those in favor? All those in favor? That's better. Um, all those opposed, that item carries. IE 20.3, amendment to purchase order number 6046731 for the D building phase two upgrades design at the Ashbridges Bay treatment plant. Would anyone like to hold this item? Would someone like to move the item? Councillor Layton, all those in favor? Any opposed, that item carries. IE 20.3. Four, award of contract number request for proposal 20 ECS MI 02 AB to CH2M Hill um, Canada Limited for professional services for detailed design, contract administration, and post construction services for a new biosolids 
pelletizer facility at the Ashbridges Bay treatment plant. Would someone like to hold the item? Anybody like to move the item? Councillor Pasternak, all those in favor? Anyone opposed? Seeing none opposed, item carries. IE 20.5 amendment to purchase order number 6048895 with BridgeCon Construction Limited for the rehabilitation of Islington Avenue over the Humber River Bridge. Would anyone like to hold this item? Someone like to move the item? Councillor Pasternak, all those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none opposed, that item carries. IE 20.6, award of contract number RFP 20ECSTI22BE to Morrison Hirschfield Limited for professional engineering services for the bridge program management assignment. Would anyone like to hold this item? Seeing none, um, would someone like to move the item? Councillor Layton, all those in favor? All those opposed? Seeing none opposed, that item carries. IE 20.7 amendment to purchase order number 6049196 with EBC Incorporated for the replacement of Albion Road culvert over Albion Creek and Islington Avenue culvert over Berry Creek and the rehabilitation of Red Water Drive culvert over Berry Creek and Toledo Road culvert over Elmcrest Creek. I have to thank whoever wrote that title. Um, would anybody like to hold this item? Okay, somebody like to move it? Councillor Pasternak, all those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none opposed, that item carries. IE 20.8, amendment to the blanket contract number 47020198, issue to Municipal Maintenance Incorporated for the Mechanical Litter Removal Services. Anyone like to hold the item? Can I hold the item? If I could hold the item, please. And might I also make the suggestion that we hold the item down until the end of the meeting um, after items with deputants? Okay, um, anyone opposed to that idea? Okay, seeing none, we'll hold that to the no, end of the meeting. Sounds fine. We'll hold that to the end of the meeting. 20.9, Solid Waste Management Services Participation in South London Air Monitoring Network. Would anyone like to hold this item? Would somebody like to move the item? Councillor Pasternak, thanks, thanks for all your initiative today. Um, anyone opposed? <laughs> Someone's seeing, got to move it, my gosh. Seeing no opposition, <laughs> that item carries. IE 20.10, non-motorized watercraft storage and launch locations. I will hold this. Um, likewise, seeing no, um, no disagreement, I'll hold it to the end of the meeting. There is a motion to move on to this one. Uh, Councillor Fletcher has a, a letter. Um, regarding that item? Yes, uh, she has a, a letter and I will move um, a recommendation on her behalf on that one. Uh, IE 20.11 Broadview and Eastern Flood Protection Environmental Assessment. Would anyone like to hold this item? Okay, um, I'll, I'm prepared to move it. Um, anybody opposed to the item? Seeing no opposition, that item carries. IE 20.12, active TO. I will hold this item as there are deputations. IE, sorry, and that is active TO, lessons learned from 2020 and next steps for 2021. IE 20.13, cycling network plan 2021, cycling infrastructure installation first quarter update. Likewise, I will hold as there are deputations. IE 20.14, dedicated bikeways, infrastructure inspection and maintenance strategy. There are no deputations confirming. Um, would somebody like to um, move this item? Councillor Cole, uh, is anybody opposed to the item? Seeing no opposition, that item carries. IE 20.15, changes to community council delegations, authorization of designated speed limit areas, 30 kilometers per hour on public lanes and local roads, and designation of reserve lane and speed limits on reserve lane for Eglinton Avenue, light rail transit segregated right of way. I will hold this item as there is a registered speaker on this item. 
IE 20.16, temporary delegation to the general manager transportation services to approve temporary road closures up to and including 365 consecutive days for Toronto Transit Commission easier access phase three projects. Uh, would anybody like to hold this item? Would somebody like to move it? Councillor Pasternak, I can always count on you. Is there any opposition to this item? Seeing none, that item carries. IE 20.17, um, uh, Deputy Mayor, would you like to hold this item? I think we have speakers on. on. Yep. Okay. We'll, we have speakers on it, right? Yeah, we'll hold for speakers. So it holds itself. Okay, at this time, <laughs> I will introduce a new item of business on behalf of Councillor Wong Tam. We'll pull it up. I don't see it on CMP. There we go. So we are moving it onto the agenda and then it will come up onto CMP and you can read it in more detail. So this is just to move it onto the agenda. It is item uh, titled protecting and supporting frontline parks, forestry and recreation staff. I'm prepared to move that to the agenda. We can vote on the item later though. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. Is it's it a on inter a on question that it's a point of order? Yep. Um, and maybe it's of the clerk. Oh, uh, no, no, that's fine. I, I, I'll let me look at the report and and um, okay. if I have a point of order, I'll get back to you. Okay, so we're just moving it onto the agenda. Um, I'm prepared to move it. We'll just move the screen back. All those in favor of moving it onto the agenda? All those opposed? Seeing no opposition, we'll move it onto the agenda. The next item for introduction onto the agenda, Councillor Leighton, I understand you have a new business item to introduce to the agenda. Yes, thank you very much. If clerks could put it on the screen. This is in relation to a notification for construction and road occupations, um, just to, to give BIAs and others greater notification or at least clarity on the process. I guess we called it request for review of work zone coordination consultation practices. Okay, when we switch back screens, we'll just vote on introducing it to the agenda. Notification procedures. All those in favor? All those opposed? Seeing no opposition, that's added to the agenda. Uh, uh, Councillor Pasnak, I understand you have two new business items to move on to the agenda? I do, yes. Uh, so one is um, concerning our environment days. Um, Councillors received a memo on March the 11th postponing environment days to at least um, after July the 1st. Uh, I have brought a motion to have staff be ready to do uh, hybrid environment days where we use transfer stations and a drive through uh, strategy to keep them safe. We'd like staff to continue to keep that option open. And that's the first item I'd like to introduce. Okay, when the screen changes back, we'll vote on introducing creating a plan for safe environment days. All those in favor of introducing the item? All those opposed? Seeing no opposition, this is added to the agenda. And Councillor Pasternak, your second item. Yeah, so in Earl Bales Park, uh, we have the Barry Zuckerman Amphitheater. Uh, this is an outdoor venue that seats about 1,500 people. Um, it's rarely more than about 20% occupied, so there's lots of, lots of room for seating and social distancing. It has a very large stage 
which allows uh, performers uh, or musicians to also distance. I just wanted to, uh, this is only to really have staff ready, uh, if it's safe, to have this uh, venue functional uh, this coming summer. Usually events don't occur, start till about July. Uh, but this is the um, ideal venue in a post-pandemic world where with some safety measures uh, and some open minds, we can we can potentially get it going uh, this summer. So I'm I'm just asking staff to be ready with a safety plan. Okay, um, we'll vote on moving that to the agenda. All those in favor? All those opposed? Seeing none opposed, that item is added to the agenda. So those will be posted onto CMP for your review and we'll deal with those items at the end of the meeting. Uh, that brings us back to IE 20.12, Active TO Lessons Learned from 2020 and Next Steps for 2021. Uh, we have 13 speakers on this item. Uh, we will hear from our deputants, then we'll move to questions of staff. Our first deputant is uh, Gilles Penaloza um, with our third act. Do we have Mr. Penaloza on the line? Okay. Welcome. You have five minutes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Well, first, I want to congratulate City Council and staff, the Transportation Department for Active TO. I think it was a huge success in 2020 when we needed physical uh, activity, but distance. I think the slow streets, I think it was a very good initiative, but I think uh, I think it should continue, but hopefully with a different name. Slow Street is around a hospital where cars have to be slow because they don't make noise. So we don't need a slow street, we need a lively street, or as people call it all over North America, uh, slow, slow streets, not quiet streets. I think the quiet street from the beginning, the name was wrong, but, but I think it was a good initiative. I think they protected bikeways was also a good initiative, but we need to create a network, like Mayor Torres said, to develop a, a, like all, all over the subways. We urgently need the Young Street and many others to have a network. And also the weekend opening of streets and closing them to cars, such, such as the Lakeshore, I think it was a huge success. And I think that they will continue. I think more than anything, it reminded us that the streets are public space. They belong to everybody. People with cars, people without cars, young and old and rich and poor and everybody. This was, this is, a, Active TO is about social integration. All of a sudden we meet each other as equals and that is something very important now that we need a, a Toronto for all. I think that we need to keep in mind that this should be a program. The only way to have the impact. I led, before immigrating to Canada, I led one in Bogota where I found a few kilometers and we turned it into the world's largest pop-up park. Every Sunday of the year, 52 Sundays plus holidays, we do 121 kilometers and there is more than one out of every four people, over a million people. And I have promoted this program in more than 350 cities all over the world in every continent. But the, in order to have the health benefits, mental and physical, you gotta do it weekly. It's week after week after week. It's not an event. This is not like Canada Day. Also, uh, it's very important to have an anchor. So I suggest now they are saying that Lakeshore West might not, uh, might not happen because of construction. I truly enjoy Lakeshore West last year. I went maybe 90% of the weekends, uh, sometimes cycling, sometimes running. Mostly I, I saw a lot of people cycling. I saw a lot of road cyclists, and, and, and I think that was really good for that segment. But I'm suggesting, and I, I sent the, the to the committee a map because I suggest there should be an anchor. The anchor should be blur and young. From blur from end to end, at least from the Humber River to blur and then to the Danforth to the beaches, and then young from blur to Lake Ontario. That should be the anchor. In addition to that anchor, there should be connections to all of the city. The connections can be in big arterials or they can be in smaller roads. They don't have to be in as big as Blur and Young, but, but there has to be an anchor. This is about connectivity. 
We are a city or neighborhoods. We are extremely divided by race, by income, by ethnicity. And this would be amazing to integrate as one citywide network. And it's not only because this is, this is amazing fun and games, but because of the benefits. This is good for mental health. It is good for physical health. It is fantastic for local business because people walk and bike and run and they, go, they stop in the shops, they have brunch, they, eat coffee, they, they drink coffee, they do shopping. Also, the level of the noise goes down. The quality of the air is much more pure. So it's something that is really fantastic. So I, I ask you to consider that we do it weekly from May to the end of September, all of Bloor and Young Street and many other connections. It may happen also Lakeshore West connecting to Bloor through High Park, but the anchor must be those two. So I truly appreciate, I congratulate on the activities. So keep on with Quiet Street, changing the name to Slow Streets or Lively Streets and the Protected by Relay to the Network. But this on Sundays, every single Sunday, let's do Bloor and Young with multiple connections to Scarborough North and other places in the city. Thank you very much. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, our next uh, deputant is Gideon Foreman with the David Suzuki Foundation. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Can Thank you hear you. me okay? I can hear you, you have five minutes. Thanks so much, Hi. Madam Chair. Yeah. And thank you, uh, committee members. Um, what can I do for uh, you? You called me. As the chair, as the chair mentioned, my name is Gideon Foreman, and I'm a transportation policy analyst at the David Suzuki Foundation, and we're here to offer a strong support for a complete street pilot on Midtown Young. We support this visionary project, Madam Chair, for a number of reasons. First, it will benefit stores and restaurants that have been battered by COVID. As staff made clear in their excellent report, the proposal is designed to assist neighborhood merchants, and I quote, Similar to Destination Danforth, this young project would focus on supporting local Main Street businesses, unquote. Because the project would be good for business, Madam Chair, it's not surprising that Toronto's business leaders have endorsed it. For example, Christopher J. Ween, the chief operating officer at Lanterra Management, recently offered his support. As you know, uh, Lanterra is one of the city's most respected condominium developers. Mr. Ween added his name to an open letter that reads in part, and I quote, Making Midtown Young into a complete street and bringing back Cafe Tio on-street patios will also offer a much needed boost to our main street businesses after this winter's tough lockdown, unquote. As well, the proposed pilot will help the city meet its climate targets. When the COVID pandemic has been tamed, and we certainly hope that soon, the city will still face that other emergency. Gasoline-powered cars are a massive source of greenhouse gas emissions, and we cannot tackle the climate crisis unless we give residents safe, convenient alternatives. The pilot is great, Madam Chair, because it makes leaving the car at home more attractive. It will connect bike lanes on Bloor to future lanes on Main Street, such as Eglinton, a key step in creating a cycling network that runs citywide. It will let us reach our jobs downtown or visit a restaurant uptown without using a motor vehicle. The pilot will also make a real contribution to public health, improving our fitness and allowing residents to travel and exercise in a physically distanced manner. No wonder, Madam Chair, that local physicians and Doctors for Safe Cycling endorse the project. Finally, the pilot is democratic. Local residents want it. In fact, nine residents groups, nine, including the Federation of North Toronto Residents Associations, the Deer Park Residents Group, and the Lytton Park Residents Organization, signed an open letter that we circulated supporting the pilot. Good for business, good for the climate, good for health, good for democracy. A complete street on Midtown Young would benefit Toronto in a host of ways, Madam Chair. We urge you to support it, and we're certain your constituents will applaud you if you do. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, thank you again. Seeing none, our next speaker is Robert Zyko Z sorry, Robert Zykowski. And hopefully I said that right. Are you on the line? Um, close enough. Close enough? Well, you can correct me. Feel free to. Uh, you have five minutes. Thank you for joining us today. 
Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good morning, members of the Infrastructure and Com Environment Committee. I'm a longtime road safety advocate with groups such as Cycle Toronto and the Toronto Community Bikeways Coalition. I'm also author of the Two Wheel Politics Bike Blog. This past year was a historic one for Toronto's cycling community, with a net total of 31 kilometers of on-street bike lanes installed, including the completion of a 15-kilometer east-west bikeway along Bloor Danforth. However, that was the pace Toronto needed to have maintained to keep the 2016 cycling network plan on track. The first four years of that plan saw less bike lanes installed than last year alone, leaving us more than 100 kilometers behind. Upon reviewing the motion in front of us today, it's clear this year's active TO plan does not go far enough. The idea of building bike lanes on Young Street based on the highly successful destination Danforth with Cafe TO patios and other street streetscaping improvements, welcome new line and serve a critical route between downtown and midtown. However, this young proposal only covered floor to Davidsville due to ongoing Eglitz across town LRT construction. While I could understand this constraint, the city needs to ensure a northern extension to Lawrence can happen next year. It's also worth exploring a southern extension to Girard per an earlier motion Councillor Wong Tam introduced last fall. In addition to Young, this year's active TO motion includes a trail of Bayview to help with the Lord Don Trail closure, while another motion being debated today will add another two kilometers to the bikeway network. Added Winona and Esplanade Mill coming to this committee later this spring, and this year's proposed installations will still be less than half of those of last year. This year's motion does not address overlay, which remains under consideration since last year, something which needs to pre be prioritized and something that uh, some students from Mark Gardner Collegiate will be discussing um, later on. Not to mention, the Toyoko continues to get very little new infrastructure other than short stretches of the Kingsway and Dundas, which don't connect to anything. If the Toyoko is to become more bike friendly, it needs to consider two projects. The Bloor bike lanes need to be extended further west from Runnymede to six points at Kipling. The recently completed intersection reconstruction did include good quality race cycle tracks, but they are isolated. The other TOEICO project we're supporting is the Better Dundas Coalition's ask for a complete street of Dundas from Scarlet to Islington. Even if nothing can be done this year, both projects need to become part of the next three-year implementation plan to at this committee later this year. The thing that disappoints me most about this active TO motion is the exclusion of the flagship weekend closures on Lakeshore West. My partner and I live very close to this corridor and high park, which meant we use those closures and the Barton Goodman Trail often. When the closures took place, we were finally able to practice physical distancing while biking along Lakeshore, whereas we needed to wear masks without them due to overcrowding. The other section of construction at King, Queen, Queensway, Roncesvalles is no excuse not to prioritize providing space for people who walk or bike over the inconvenience of motorists especially as a third COVID-19 wave looms upon us and temperatures warm up. Even closing one or two lanes of Lakeshore West would help a lot with the physical distancing on this corridor. This is not the time for Toronto to stop being bold. While I fully support the installation of bike lanes on Young, Toronto needs to make last year's 31 kilometers of bike lane installations the new standard instead of a one-off. The city needs to reinstate the popular active TO closures on Lakeshore West as well as include overlay. Finally, the city needs to address the Toby Cope by extending the Bloor bike lanes to six points and install a complete street on Dundas as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, thank you, Robert. Uh, seeing no questions, our next uh, speaker is David Simmer, Open Streets TO Working Group. David? Good morning. Uh, my name is David Seymour. I'm here speaking today on behalf of Open Streets Toronto. Uh, Open Streets Toronto is a nonprofit organization that has overseen and operated Toronto's Open Streets program since 2014. And Open Streets programs are mass free recreational public health programs that open streets to people by closing them to cars. They create paved parks or free outdoor gyms for people to walk, run, bike, rollerblade, skateboard, unicycle, crab walk, uh, participate in healthy recreation, 
and it brings this opportunity directly to people's front doors through repurposing an existing asset or streets into a greater and higher use. There are hundreds of open streets programs around the world with the biggest taking place every Sunday of the year with routes that are hundreds of kilometers long. And if that idea, if that concept sounds familiar, it's because it is in essence the same idea delivered to such great success by Active TO and Transportation last summer on Lakeshore West and East and Bayview Avenue. Since 2014, OpenStreets TO has delivered 14 program dates on Young and Bloor Streets, providing hundreds of thousands of Torontonians with access to healthy streets and recreation. Uh, but if we're being honest, it was not always a smooth ride. Um, when we first pitched OpenStreets to the city in 2013 and 2014, uh, it was a different administration. Uh, there weren't many folks at that time who were all that interested in exploring how transportation infrastructure uh, could be about more than moving metal boxes at unsafe speeds and polluting the air. It was a really tough sell that streets can be a vector for recreation and improving public health. And so when we fast forward to 2020, uh, there we were partnering with Active TO, extending the reach of ATTO to Young Street on two Sundays in September. And I think it's a really great indication of how far we've come over the last few years. You know, as indicated in the staff report, these extensions were really well received and we really want to thank the city, thank transportation, thank Meritory for uh, sort of championing active TO. I think it's really encouraging to see transportation staff thinking not just about the very important hard infrastructure, but also thinking about running ongoing programs like active TO. Uh, some of the most successful and impactful open streets programs, like those in Bogota, in Paris, and in New York, are run directly by the city themselves. And the benefits those cities gain with regards to public health, air quality, and social connection are immense. Uh, just as an example, for every dollar that the city of Bogota invests in their open streets program, they save three dollars on healthcare costs. And during a pandemic that, you know, for so many of us has seen us sort of we've had our, our ties severed to the things that keep us physically and mentally healthy. Um, you know, Active TO provided a vital outlet for so many to keep active and socially connected and a safe and physically distanced manner. And so recognizing that fact, there have been open streets programs in places like Los Angeles and New York that expanded their reach during the pandemic. And Open Streets Toronto was really proud to have supported those efforts in 2020. Uh, and we are here as a resource to the city to continue to do so in 2021. We are just happy and ready to support Active TO in bringing the benefits of this amazing program to as many Torontonians as possible. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions of this stipendiant? Okay. Um, thank you very much, David, for your deputation. Our next deputant is Giselle Cordova with Mark Garneau Collegiate Institute. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair you. and community members. Um, I'm here with a group of six representatives from a high school. Could I please ask that we all have a chance to speak before taking any questions from the committee? Um, sure, can you just let me know how many are there? We have six, Five. six representatives. Six. Okay, um, the only one I have, one, two, three, four, five listed at Mark Garneau um, is, is Huda with you? Yes, she is. Okay, great. So um, go ahead. Um, and then uh, each speaker has a maximum of five minutes. And you're up first. Thank you. Good morning, members of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. My name is Giselle Cordova. I am a teacher at Mark Garneau Collegiate Institute, speaking to you today about a serious issue in the Thorncliffe and Flemington Park neighborhoods. Thorncliffe Park and Flemington Park are two densely populated and integrated communities with a high immigrant population, separated from one another by the Don River Ravine and connected by the Charles H. Hiscott Bridge, referred to by residents of the Flemington Thorncliffe neighborhood as the Overly Bridge. Mark Garneau Collegiate Institute and Valley Park Middle School are located at the southwest and northwest corner of the Overly and Don Mills Road, respectively. This means that thousands of people in the community walk across the Overly Bridge daily, including 4,000 students. It's been known for years that the bridge is dangerous and there has been discussion about an upgrade, yet there has been no movement from the city and its leaders. The school year, students and teacher Tim Langford's grade 12 tech class at Mark Garneau highlighted an existing issue with the Overlead Bridge, identifying concerns and introducing possible solutions, 
through their structural designs that reflected the community's concerns. A Mark Farno student, Zainab Zakia, went further to share her experience of this project and concerns of the Overly Bridge in an interview by Ismaila Alpha on CBC Metro Morning. Students were given a platform and in various classes to express and share their daily experiences and, concern, and concerns traveling across the bridge to the local politicians and other stakeholder groups. The work of these Mark Arno students, it has elevated this issue within the community. And now students, teachers, and community members came together to raise safety concerns regarding the current state of the Overly Bridge. Many students, residents, and community stakeholders have suggested the vital improvements um, for road safety measures, such as better lighting, wider walkways, or improved barriers. But the possible increased risk of COVID-19 transmission was also raised due to the bridge's narrow pedestrian walkways. Our grassroots for an improved bridge has extended beyond the classroom, impacting the rest of the student population as a school-wide initiative at Mark Darnell and expanding to the Flemington Park and Thorncliffe Park community. Today, you will be hearing from students, teachers, and parents who want something done about the dangerous conditions on this bridge. Overly Active TO is a project that could have addressed the community's needs during this pandemic by creating more space for people to safely walk and cycle across the bridge. 10 months after the bridge was announced, there has not been any consultation between the city and the community. Other Active TO projects have been advanced in other areas in Toronto, while there has been no activity in the Thorncliffe and Flemington area. We believe that the overly active bridge can be a first step in supporting the community's needs to help overcome the challenges they are experiencing with this bridge. The stories you are about to hear from the parents and students of this community highlight the collective experiences of other families. We are asking for you to please listen to the testimonial accounts from the people here today, and then take the next step to addressing their concerns immediately move the overly active teal project from under consideration to public consultation thank you thank you our next deputant is zanib zaikia my name is zana zaikia and i am a student at marco collegiate institute I have been a resident of Thorncliffe Park all my life and feel a deep connection to the bridge. The bridge has several problems that my classmates and I face daily. There is barely any space to socially distance. The sidewalk on the bridge is only 1.5 meters wide and students are constantly pushing each other. On days that it rains and snows, a lot of people slip and get injured. People get splashed by passing cars because water and filthy slush collects on the bridge. The railing is really low, and with students constantly pushing and leaning on the bridge, it is really scary. When I walk home from the bridge in the winter, the bridge is really dark. It feels very unsafe, especially when there is no security surveillance and no adults around. My parents never allowed me to walk to school when I was at Valley Park Middle School, and even in my first few years at Mark Garneau. They hired a private school bus to take me to school because they were not willing to jeopardize my safety on the bridge. I was one of many students whose parents paid out of their pocket for their service. Every day, five school buses come to pick us up, student, pick, us, pick students up from Thorncliffe Park and take them across the bridge, even though the school is within walking distance. For most of our parents, it is very expensive hiring private buses, not to mention that we would rather get the exercise and cut carbon emissions by walking. When I walk on the bridge, I feel as if I'm confined to a small space where I'm forced to look in one direction, looking at low railings and being on the bridge that is at a very high elevation makes me feel very uneasy and anxious. People with a fear of heights do not have a pleasant experience on the bridge. Whenever I and my parents walk on the bridge, we want to reach the ends as quickly as possible. Lots of community members in both Flemington and Thorncliffe Park, including students who have to use this bridge every day, face these issues. We are depending on you to recognize our concerns. 
we ask that over the overly active TO project be moved from under consideration to immediate community consultation. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Our next deputant is Huda Kuli. Hello, can Hi. you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah. Hello, my name is Huda. I am a resident of Thorncliffe Park and a parent of four children who attend Mark Garneau Collegiate Institute and Valley Park Middle School. Along with my children, thousands of children from my community use the bridge to go to and from school every day. The commute across the bridge has always been a concern for me and other parents in the community for many reasons, like low railings, narrow sidewalk, high speed traffic. When COVID-19 hit, things got worse. My children told me that due to the narrow sidewalks, kids barely had space to practice social distancing. And guess what they said? Wait until it snows. My son jokes that you might need skis to go to school. And if it's raining, put on your swimming suit. One day, I asked my children to take some photos of the bridge after a snowy day. When I asked my son if the sidewalk was cleared, he replied, they don't need to do that, mom. The students clear the snow on behalf of the city. The safety issue is very concerning as my daughter slipped and fell due to the accumulating snow many times. But this is not only about my own kids. It's the story of all of us in the community. In every trip to and from school, kids are expecting some sort of a surprise. Unfortunately, it's usually a very unpleasant surprise and completely preventable. Last October, my kids once came home absolutely shocked and said, Mom, you won't believe what happened this morning on the way to school. There were police on the bridge and we heard, we heard that someone had jumped over the bridge. They even saw blood stains on the rocks down the valley in the ravine. What was even worse when were, were the rumors spreading among the students that the victim was a fellow student who was pushed. Later, we learned that this wasn't the case. Sadly, it was an adult who committed suicide. But you know what? The fact that kids are imagining these, type of, these types of scenarios reflects that it is indeed an unfortunate possibility, or at least a fear they consider. As parents and caring adults, we must ensure that no child has to endure even the thought of this possibility. When my family moved to Canada, our sponsor told me that I would hear from people and leaders that your safety is our priority. Coming from a conflict zone, this meant a lot for me and my family. But when I think about the bridge, I can see that there is no safety there. I would like to invite you, your kids, and anyone you care about to have a real experience walking across the bridge in the hope that you get a real sense of what our children experience at least twice a day during their journey of learning. I implore all of you as decision makers who can change this reality for a safer, better, and more pleasant future for our children and consider why our children can't go to school safely like other children. We ask that the overly active TO project to be moved from under consideration to immediate community consultation. Thank you so much. Thank you for your deputation. That brings us to our next speaker, who is Hafiz Alavi. Uh, yes, uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Hello, uh, I am Hafiz. Uh, I'm a resident of Thornfield Park. I attend school at Mark Arnold Collegiate Institute. I have to use the overly bridge to get to school every day, but the bridge is quite hazardous. I mostly bike to school and the road just isn't safe for me as drivers come too close and there's lots of traffic and heavy vehicles. And if I try to ride on the sidewalks, well, they get very crowded during the morning and evening rush hour. Whenever I ride on the road, I feel like I'm taking my chances and hoping I make it to the other side safely. Even if I walk to school, the sidewalks are insanely crowded where, where everyone is off in school during the morning afternoon rush. There's also no space to pass anyone or social distance, especially during COVID. I've seen parents with strollers 
the elderly and mobility device users struggle to use the bridge. It's just the sheer volume of students coming in and out and not having enough space to pass. And when it rains, cars have splashed with water all over me and other students because of poor drainage on the bridge. Longfield Park and Flemington Park are densely populated with a large percentage of youth. A high volume of students from Mark Arnold Collegiate Valley Park Middle School and other feeder schools use the substandard bridge every day. The bridge is only working for people who drive, and that's absurd, as most resident, residents in Thornfield and Flemington don't even drive. We need a bridge that can work for everyone, and that can't wait. Residents of Thorncliffe and Plumpton need this vital connection fulfilled, and we've been fighting to get this done. I've noticed that a lot of these problems can be fixed if this project was implemented through the Active TO initiative. This is our bridge, and we ask that overly active Active TO be moved from under consideration to immediate community consultation. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. That brings us to Nazira Shaikh with Mark Arnold. Yes. Hi, welcome, thank you. You have five minutes. Good morning. Um, good morning, my name is uh, Nazra Sheikh. I'm a parent of two children who attend elementary and secondary school in the sister communities of Flemington Park and Thorncliffe Park. Today, I'm here as the school council co-chair for Mark Arnaud Collegiate. I'm also a local business owner and a director of a federally registered charity located in Thorncliffe Park. As a daily commuter between these communities, I've witnessed firsthand the issues and concerns raised by the students from Mark Garneau and welcome their suggestions for improving the safety and well-being for everyone in our neighborhoods. Their vision to reimagine Overly is completely in line with the city's Vision Zero Road Safety Program and addresses all six emphasis areas. The fact that high school students have dedicated countless hours researching, learning, and understanding the world of bridges is in and of itself fascinating, but the students have gone above and beyond a class assignment and embraced the af act overly active TO project in an effort to make their world a better place. They are thinking globally and acting locally. In a very <coughs> short span of time, with a global pandemic lurking in the background, students have raised awareness in our communities and have even captured the attention of prominent politicians as well as the media. Our students are advocating for real change, for a safer, stress-free experience of getting to and from school, not only for themselves, but also for future generations. They understand the disproportionately high rates of COVID in our community. They understand the need to socially distance. They also understand the new variants of concern spread much more easily in dense communities like ours. It's important to note that in the very near future, these young advocates will be exercising their democratic rights and voting in elections. Some of them may even aspire to have a seat at City Hall so that they can be the change makers that we so desperately need. Recent TDSB census data shows that students in our schools do not feel supported by caring adults. This is in fact a sad reality. We have a real opportunity today to lift our students' voices, let them know that they matter, that they are being heard, and then doing something about it. As adults, our job is to ensure that our children have a safe commute to and from school. Our children should grow up having wonderful memories, free from physical danger, as well as from traumatic events that no sh child should even have to imagine. As the caring adults in this meeting today, I encourage you to reimagine Overly. Let our future generation know that they matter and that their dreams of a better bridge and a safer future are not far from reality. A public meeting to discuss the concerns raised by our students and a commitment to address those concerns with transportation services would be an ideal place to begin this conversation. We ask that the overly active TO project be moved from under consideration to immediate community consultation. Thank you, Chair McKelvey and committee for your time and careful consideration. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. That brings us to Tim Lankford. Thank you. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. You have five minutes. Good morning. My name is Tim Lankford. I'm a teacher at Mark Arnold Collegiate. Uh, while my own involvement in this issue is quite recent, I've learned that the United Community of Thorncliffe and Flemington has been expressing concerns about the lack of safety on the Overly Bridge for nearly a decade. <coughs> the mood in the community is now one of frustration as they feel their words are falling on deaf ears. We're talking about the safety of children, 11 to 17 year olds who would like to walk or cycle to school. We've heard from Zana that 
their parents will not allow them to do so because one 220 meter section of their walk or cycle the overly bridge as an educator and a parent when i learned that these parents have been paying out of pocket for private buses to get their children across the bridge i was gobsmacked You've heard from Giselle about the class project in which my tech design students redesigned the deck of the bridge to make it safer. Never in 30 years of teaching have I had a group of students who were so engaged and willing. This was the case because the vast majority of students at our school have experienced misfortune, terror or injury on this bridge. The bridge is a daily part of their lives and it's hurting them. When they're on the bridge, they don't feel free. They feel trapped. They don't feel safe. They feel in danger. Some of them experience the bridge as a daily reminder of friends who have used it to suicide. What about the isolation factor? Imagine for a moment you're a teenager again. Counselors, you might like that. You remember how important it was at that age to be able to see friends. Now imagine that most of your friends live within walking distance, but you're separated from them by a bridge that you are afraid to cross, especially after dark. The Overly Bridge is highly unusual within Toronto. We've heard today that our students do 4,000 pedestrian crossings of this bridge every weekday to get to and from school. We surmise that the only other bridge in the city that gets that volume of traffic is the Keel Street Bridge at the entry to York University. The Overly Bridge is a uniquely multi-use bridge. Why then is the bridge so obviously designed for motor vehicles? The agenda today is overly, sorry, is Active Toronto, Active TO. There is an overly Active TO project already under consideration that has the potential to solve many of the problems related to the overly bridge. We ask that this project be moved to the next stage immediately. We ask you, Claire, Chair McKelvey, to make a recommendation that our concerns about a safe link for active transport between these two vital communities be made an agenda item at the next meeting of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. We also ask that the overly active TO project be moved from under consideration to for immediate community consultation. Thank you to all six councillors for your time and attention today. Okay, thank you. That was the last of the deputants from Mark Garneau Collegiate Institute. So we'll move to questions. Um, we'll start with outside to councillors. Okay, I'd like to speak, please, Councillor Robinson. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Councillor Robinson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, I have a few questions and thank you to the sp students uh, from Mark Garneau. Um, Councillor Min and Wong and I were fortunate enough to have a consultation with you. We enjoyed that very much and thank you for coming today. Um, I wanted to know if you were aware that consultation on a major bridge improvement project for Overly is actually underway, um, the planning and the model, and uh, were you aware that, that, was, that there is consultation happening in 2021 for uh, an overhaul of this bridge? I'll take that question. Yes, uh, Councillor Robinson, uh, Jacqueline Hayward has informed us that that is the case. However, what we are looking for is not consultation regarding the complete reconstruction of the bridge. What we are looking for is immediate consultation about temporary measures that can make the bridge safe now. Five years from now in 2026 is too late, too long for these students to wait 
for a safe bridge, we are looking for immediate consultation. We are asking for a public meeting on this issue for temporary measures that can be put into place immediately. So you're you're aware that there's a full overall happening, and that, are you also aware? Because I have to position my things as a question. Uh, that the staff are proposing higher railings as well as suicide barriers, which I've been fighting for for years for this bridge. Um, all of that is happening as part and parcel of this. Um, this I think it's going to be multi-million dollars. I don't have the price tag in front of me, but do you, do you understand that that is all unfolding right now and consultation will be happening this spring or summer as they plan the consultation process? Sorry, what what uh, what is the timeline for the um, the last two things that you had mentioned, the uh, suicide barriers and so on? So consultation would be first, is my understanding from staff, and then followed by design and then implementation. So our understanding was that um, this summer, summer of twenty twenty one, there were scheduled uh, repairs to the bridge plus some consultation regarding complete overhaul of the bridge for 2026. That would be the first stage, the environmental assessment stage of the consultations. Yeah, so I'm not sure the date is, I, I have to ask my, my. Uh, so I, I don't, we'll have to refer to staff, but I don't think it's as long as 2026, but the consultation is being framed up as we speak by city staff. Um, so I hope you, you're aware of that. Okay, are there any additional questions of the deputants? Councillor Layton. Yes, Madam Chair. <laughs> Councillor Layton first, and then I'll. Sorry, I, I did recognize Councillor Layton, but I think I might have cut myself off. So go ahead, Councillor Layton. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you to the deputants for speaking today, uh, for the students and um, uh, for their parents and for school administrators. So it, it does sound like there's a long term plan that is coming um, and, and we'll get, we can get some clarification from staff about when that might happen, that the consultation that's gonna, gonna start this year. Um, is that what you're asking or today asking for? No. <laughs> so can we just get, and if you could just, just very quickly and just to restate it, what, what, did it, what is it Beyond moving the active TO project from the currently the um, I, I can't remember the terminology. My 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 apologies. It's, I'm I'm going blank right now. But bringing it forward to put it in the um, in the immediate consultation category. What, what on the ground work would you like to see happen? Yes. So thank you, thank you for the question, Councillor Layton. In addition to. Um, to a public meeting on this issue, we would like, we ideally, we would like to see that public meeting lead to temporary measures that will make the bridge safe for our students. And you, and you suppose that these temporary measures are not unlike the ones that we're seeing in other parts of the city on the Danforth, on Bloor Street, University Avenue. Exactly. Interventions in the roadway. I don't. I don't know if you've, if you've seen the bridge or if you've walked the bridge, but it um, one of the the major issues with is what was discussed, which is very narrow pedestrian area, which could be remedied. Um, we believe it could be remedied at, at fairly low cost and without reconstructing the entire deck of the bridge. Sorry, could you repeat that one point the, to to expand the uh, the pedestrian? Yes, clear ways. Yes. Okay, we believe it's possible to expand it 
without reconstructing the entire deck of the bridge. Okay, and to answer your question, I have been up on that bridge because the students at Mark Garneau invited me up for a presentation many years ago. I think it was five or six years ago, but I took this, uh, the, the bus up there through uh, the cliff and, um, and walked across that bridge because I think I got off at the wrong stop. Um, the, um, so, May I ask like, it, it, it sounds like today, if we were to undertake I, or, or go with the staff foundation, and I, I'm going to try to go back and get some clarity, that any improvements would be quite a ways off. Now, if there wasn't an engineered solution that could come um, in a timely manner, i.e. in the next couple of months, is there a way to... I'm, I'm just trying to think, because if there's not a quick solution here about expanding the pedestrian space, it may be some time until the capital work is ready to, to happen on the bridge. I think that's what Councillor Robinson was cautioning, um, that it, it, it still may be some time and there, there, there will be some rounds of consultation between now um, and, uh, and that point, just to make sure we get it right. Yes, and we would like to fast track that. We, we, what we are saying is we can't wait another five years. It, I was, you know, not not um, even kidding in my deputation when I said that the community has been complaining about this problem for nearly a decade. It goes all the way back to 2012 that this issue has been raised by by parents at Valley Park Middle School. There was a, a study done by TCAT between 2014 and 2018 that made recommendations for uh, bike lanes along the length of Overly Boulevard. Uh, that uh, resulted in bike lanes being put somewhere else instead on Thorncliffe Park Drive and, and so on where they don't really need them. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm running out of time here, so I'm just going to thank you all uh, very much for your deputations here today. Okay, thank you, um, Councillor Pasternak, Stop and then I now see Deputy Mayor Wong has questions as well. Go ahead, Councillor Pasternak. Oh, go ahead. Okay. So some of my thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And, and thank you to the representatives of, of Mark Garneau for coming and advocating for your school. So I, I think I have a sort of a girl a Google worldview of this this bridge. It looks like four four lanes in both directions. Um, it looks like a very narrow pedestrian a walkway on both sides of the bridge. Um, and and I've heard a number of issues. It, it doesn't look like it's um, Kind of crumbling, it's in better shape than a lot of the streets in my area. Um, does anyone know whether an engineering report has done has been done on this on this bridge to make recommendations? And usually we we look at quick fixes and then we look at long term. Right. So the um, the deputation that we're doing here today. Sorry, is the question directed at, at me? Yeah, if you have that information, if not, we'll wait for staff. The deputation that we're doing here today arose uh, largely because of uh, Huda, one of the members of our deputation team, Huda Cooley, brought it to the attention of the press back in November. At that time, um, an architecture firm, Brown and Story, did a design. There was a proposed, a quick fix to the problems of the bridge. It was submitted to Toronto Transportation Services. I've been informed by Toronto Transportation Services that that quick fix is not suitable because it would create additional loading on the bridge deck that could not be supported by the structure. So what we are saying is, let's talk about it. Let's have a meeting about it and try and figure out another possible quick fix that could be done this summer. I have some ideas in my head, but so do lots of other people. Well, 
so this this architectural firm uh, Brown Brown Story, did you say? Brown yes. Story is a firm. So they they were retained by the city or or, or by no, the they did a pro bono. Okay. So there have been discussions. Um, they're just not going anywhere. There's lots of talk. Correct. Um, but they don't seem to be going anywhere. Now, you, you mentioned the narrow, I guess, the narrow pedestrian walkways. And, and, and that's so that, I guess, I don't know, can a stroller even fit on, on, on you this? Can fit on six, this? You can fit single file. If there's a stroller or a wheelchair, that person can go, but no one can get by them. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, now you mentioned um, suicide, um, and and many bridges now have um, suicide barriers where we cage, we kind of cage in the pedestrian way. They're particularly pre prevalent along the 400 series highways. Has that been has that been talked about or advanced? And when um, when Councillor Robinson mentioned that uh, the idea of suicide barriers being planned. Just now, a few minutes ago, that was the first that we had heard of it. Mm -hmm. so there's about uh, one suicide every four years off of that bridge. Um, and sadly, it's often a student from our school. Right. Okay, so um, if we were to summarize the problem, it's crowding on the pedestrian uh, walkway uh is is really the main issue um you need you need a wider sort of pedestrian corridor on both sides of the is that that's the big issue yes and the the suicide problem to us is also a big issue okay all right thank you very much thank you okay thank you councillor pasternak the next for questions was deputy mayor min and wong yeah, um, uh, thanks, Councillor. So the bridge isn't going to get any any wider, and there's uh, two lanes of traffic each way on either side. Um, there's a there's a there's a pathway. So my understand I mean, the only way that I think that you can do this you know, a short term solution would be to take out one of the part or a full. A full lane of traffic. If your idea is to increase pedestrian and, um, access, My, is there any other way that you, that you want to tell us that you yes. have to be done? We don't think that's necessary, Councillor Min and Wong. So where do you get the extra space? I actually have a plan. I have I have drawn up a plan. I've done the math on it, and I have a plan for how to do it without actually disturbing any vehicle traffic whatsoever. And what we would like to do is just to talk about it at a public meeting. Just I'd like to see it. So if you wanted to send it to me and I think Councillor Robinson, I don't know if she's still on the call. I think we'd both like to see it. So, um, but the thing, the thing I don't know how you make space out of where there's, where there's no space available. That would be okay. something I'd really like to see. So. If you can send it to me, that would be great. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm finished. Sorry, Min and Wong, um, Councillor Min and Wong. I would like to. What, what we're asking here is for a meeting to discuss the very questions you are asking with our community members. Um, we would like to include them in this discussion. Um, Active TO has already had some ideas about the temporary measures, and we would like to continue this discussion. But we would like to be given a platform to have this public meeting. The plans keep getting pushed forward. And um, and we would like a platform to finally have proper consultation with our community members. Thank you, Madam Chair. I finished my questions. Okay, thank you. Are there any additional questions of the deputants? Okay, we will return back to deputants. There are three deputants remaining on this item. The next one is Josh Fullen with Maximum City. You have five minutes. Hi, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, thank you uh, to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair, for this opportunity. I work for an organization, Maximum City, that has been studying the impacts of COVID-19 on children and youth across Canada. I just want to share um, some relevant findings today that I think will provide some evidence to, uh, I just heard the last couple deputations, and I think really the value of something like active TO. Uh, and the quiet streets programs that we see both in Toronto and elsewhere. 
So our study really looks at three different areas. One is healthy movements. So that includes things like sleep, screen time, physical activity. Uh, the other area we look at is well-being. So that includes emotions, safety, and life satisfaction. And then the third area of the study is school experience. So, the, so what kind of school are children participating in? What are some of the barriers to learning that they're experiencing during COVID? And what is their school engagement like? So just before I get into um, the really pertinent evidence for this group, I want to share some of the overall uh, findings that are in the materials that I uh, attached to my request to, to uh, depute today. So there, we know from looking at this data a year into studying um, those three areas across Canadian children and youth, that there are certain things that put you in a group or, or in groups that uh, show worse outcomes across healthy movement, well-being, and school experiences. So the things that put you in the, that are more likely to have negative, sorry, excuse me, sorry, the groups that are more likely to have negative impacts include kids who live in apartment buildings, who live in large municipalities like the City of Toronto, who do not have access to outdoor space, are Black, Indigenous, or people of colour, children and youth. They come from lower income households. They participate in school online or hybrid. They have extra support needs at school and they report a decrease in play. And then if you look at the other group, the group that the groups that do better, the things that are associated with better well-being, better school experience, and better healthy move, movement include physical activity, time outside, participating in school in person, having a pet, less time on screens, having a friend or a sibling to talk to, having access to outdoor space, parental engagement, and time frame. So that's just the overall summary of subgroups and who sort of who's getting hit harder and who's doing better during COVID. But the, the really relevant information I want to share today that relates to streets and how they can be safe streets can be health and equity power moves are these two data points. So nine in ten children and youth say they have safe access to a park or playground. So that's pretty good. Most kids have safe access to a park and a playground. And that tracks if you put the objective sort of green space and parks layer under the data, you can see that that's true. But when we ask kids where they spend most of their outdoor time during COVID, the number one answer is private yard. But let's get rid of that answer because we know not everyone has a private yard and we know the kids who are getting hit hardest are the ones who live in apartment buildings and don't have access to outdoor space. The, the most popular answer after you get rid of out, uh, after you get rid of private yards in terms of where kids are spending their outdoor time is streets and sidewalks. So anything you can do as a city, as a committee, to make streets and sidewalks safe places for play, interaction, and mobility will have tremendous impact on the health, well-being, school experiences of children and youth. And the data shows this. Uh, the, the safe streets will provide time outside, they'll provide time playing, they'll provide physical activity, they'll provide social interactions. So those are all of the protective factors that we know are good for kids during COVID and coming out of COVID. So that sort of rounds off what I wanted to share is that anything that you can do to make streets and sidewalks safe, healthy places, even more than even more so than parks during COVID, they're proving to be the places where kids are spending their time. So it is essential that we meet kids where they are to protect their health and well-being on streets and sidewalks. I thank you for your time. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, our next deputant is Jessica Speaker with Friends and Families for Safe Streets. Jessica, you have five minutes. Thank you. My name is Jessica Speaker, and I'm here to represent a group called Friends and Families for Safe Streets. We are a group of people whose loved ones have been senselessly killed in preventable crashes on Toronto's deadly streets, and also people like myself who survived a crash with severe life-altering injuries. We are the people who have paid the toll for Toronto's poor street design. And even though it's too late for all of us, we're doing our best to work to make sure that other people are spared from experiencing the lifelong trauma, pain, and grief that we have. We want to express our strong disappointment that city staff would recommend doing away with the most successful, widely used portion of active TO, the Lakeshore West opening. 
And we feel that way because active TO turned out to be a better vision zero plan than our actual vision zero plan. City staff suggest this because they're worried about driving convenience, because there's also a nearby road construction project, which means that people driving cars might face two inconveniences and might spend more time driving somewhere. But it goes entirely against Toronto's commitment to Vision Zero to value car commuting convenience over human health and safety. The reason that the opening of Lakeshore West brought such joy and freedom and health benefits to the residents who used it is because there was no hostile safety threat from drivers. If some of those tens of thousands of daily users of the Lakeshore West opening go out and try to recapture that feeling by going for a walk, a run, or a roll on other streets, it's certain that many of them will be harmed by reckless drivers. After all, the city promised us safe streets and an end to death and severe injury by this year, 2021. But we have yet to see the bold changes that really save lives, and so the needle on road violence hasn't significantly budged. In a supposed Vision Zero City, potential driving delays cannot be the only factor weighed in decisions about road space allocations. What about the time wasted on the other side of the windshield? Time that's forever lost to planning funerals, recovering in hospitals, lifelong physical and mental health treatment, shuttling to and from appointments, living in depression, anxiety, PTSD, and fear. What about that time? You've probably already heard my story. A reckless driver broke my spine and inflicted tons of other damage to me in 2015. I've spent the last six years now with chronic pain and I've become utterly dejected and I'm stalled in my life. I can't progress in my career and I can't earn the money that it would take to retrain for something else. I've delayed starting a family because I can't imagine being pregnant with a painful condition my back is in and my mental health is so poor after the trauma of my crash that I'm terrified that I won't be a good mom. That's over 3 million minutes and counting of living a life that I was not supposed to, drifting farther and farther away from who I wanted to be. And if I live to be 82, which is the average Canadian life expectancy, that's 23.6 million more minutes, I'll be adrift. And what about Xavier Morgan, who was killed on this exact stretch of Lakeshore West? Had he been caught by the wind while enjoying Lakeshore the way that we did last year, he would still be alive. With an average life expectancy of 82, he had about 77 years of life stolen from him. That's 40 million. 471,200 minutes of human life obliterated. In 2020, 25 vulnerable road users were killed by drivers. For the sake of a quick calculation, if we assume they had an average age of 39, which is the average age of Torontonians, that's 1,075 years of human life stolen. That's 5.5 million minutes. It usually takes about a week to plan a funeral, so that's 4,200 hours or a quarter of a million minutes stolen from bereaved families. In 2020, 124 people were severely injured by drivers. If we do a similar calculation and assume they spend about 10 hours per week on their health maintenance after a crash, that's nearly 3 million hours of treatment or almost 170 million minutes. Considering the lifelong suffering that should have been prevented, those 124 survivors lost more than 5,000 years of quality of life that's nearly 3 billion minutes. Put that together in 2020 alone, which was an unusually light year for road violence, that's 8 billion minutes. How many traffic jams would it take to make up for 8 billion minutes? The time lost to road violence is infinitely more traumatic than time lost to a traffic jam. A city that cares about creating a safe space to live rather than a place to drive through wouldn't even have to think twice about continuing and expanding the remarkable success of active TO. It's clear that when all road users time is considered the most beneficial and equitable path forward is to continue the major street opening of Lakeshore West, expand active TO, fix the overly bridge and build safe streets everywhere. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, thank you, Jessica. That brings us to our last deputant on this item, Kevin Rupasing with Cycles Toronto. You have five minutes. Hi, committee members. Are you able to hear me? We can hear you. Great, thank you. Um, thank you for having me today. I'm uh, on speaking on behalf of Cycles Toronto. Um, 
We are uh, quite supportive of the, of the Active Tier program. It was uh, a massive success in 2020 um, and an incredible approach, uh, approach by the city to actually adapt to meet residents and business needs during the pandemic. It's been very popular. It's been very successful. Um, city's data shows huge increases in cycling. Businesses have pointed to uh, this being a lifeline for them uh, as, as they get through the pandemic. Um, particularly one of the projects we're quite excited about is on Young Street. Um, the active TO and Cafe TO complete street um, along the town Young is something that's supported by a lot of different local residents, businesses, and community organizations. The, people are re really excited about seeing their main street transform um, into a destination. Uh, just as uh, Dan Destination Danforth last year um, uh, went through the same type of transformation. Um, well, while well, implementing from uh, Bloor to Davisville would be a good start, um, we think it's imperative that consultation, analysis, design, uh, and ultimately implementation should be considered further north as soon as possible uh, so that uh, residents and businesses along the entire corridor can be equitably supported as they recover from the pandemic. Um, remember, the, the goal of Active TO uh, is to provide safe mobility options for people during the pandemic. Um, Cafe TO is to support our struggling local business. Putting these together into complete streets really does make it a destination for the community. And, you know, we should also recall with uh, so much, um, you know, w w if uh, the, the subway along Young Street um, were to be shut down, having safe cycling infrastructure, uh, as well as things like bike share, um, is, offers a great alternative for people to get around during the pandemic. Um, we're confident that the success uh, that was experienced on Danforth will be replicated along Young. Similarly, if we are looking to uh, take that success from Danforth and apply it to Young, uh, we should also be talking about um, extending the Danforth project. Um, at least certainly to Victoria Park, um, so that success can also be more equitably uh, experienced across the entire corridor. Earlier today, you also heard from speakers about Overly, and some of these are incredibly moving stories of, of frustration uh, of not being heard by the city. Um, Cycle Toronto fully supports the community members' calls for this project to move forward, finally, after 10 months of being under consideration, um, to, uh, to being under community consultation, as they had asked. Looking forward, the complete streets activations um, uh, throughout Toronto, uh, the success of the Active Geo program has, has uh, you know, primarily been focused within the core, and I think we would like to see this equitably expanded throughout the city. These are immensely popular programs, and Cycle Toronto is calling for at least one Active Geo style complete street um, to be brought forward in Scarborough, North York, and Etobicoke for each year going forward, um, following you know, uh, consultation and input from community stakeholders. Looking at another prong of the Active Tier program uh, on the major road closures uh, to cars uh, on the weekends so that there's space for people uh, to enjoy active transportation, Cycle Toronto is very supportive of bringing back uh, the major road openings, um, especially you know, on uh, Richard Boulevard East and Bayview Avenue. Um, we also recommend that these roads uh, also be extended outside of the core. Um, Black Creek Drive, Allen Road, McNichol Avenue, these are all great locations um, that would uh, more equitably give uh, residents across the city access um, uh, to this uh, wonderful program. Looking at Lakeshore West, it's disappointing that the city is not recommending bringing this forward. Uh, 22,000 people every weekend uh, were walking and cycling um, uh, along our waterfront. Um, and a quarter of those people uh, said that road opening specifically helped them to start riding a bike or start, uh, uh, start riding again. That's an extraordinary number of people that embraced active transportation. Um, opening up uh, Lakeshore Boulevard to walking and cycling um, really showed us what our waterfront could be, a place uh, where families could ride together at their own pace, uh, where we could get the mental and physical health benefits of uh, being outside um, along one of our city's top destinations and staying physically distanced. Um, the pandemic is not expected to wind down this summer, um, and people are clamoring for space as the weather gets better um, uh, and, and warmer. So this program really does have an opportunity to serve um, Torontonians uh, this summer. Well, we understand there's some challenges. Um, we think there are the, the same bold and creative thinking that got the Active TO program started in the first place could be explored here. Um, things like considering summer weekends instead of all of them, or even a long-term approach that is more of a compromise that recognizes that we need to find ways to alleviate crowding on, on the waterfront trail um, and repurposes some of the lanes on Lakeshore uh, with an Active TO installation as was done, say, on Bayview. Um, to, to run parallel to the Maltese Trail. So we're fully supportive of the recommendations in Active TO and, and really hope to see the program expand um, going forward. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? 
Okay, seeing none, that moves us to questions of staff. Um, we'll start with outside councillors if there are any. So, Councillor Robinson, five minutes. Very much. I want to talk a little bit about the Young Street uh, endeavor, and I have concerns about um, just TTC. I, I don't know if there's staff from the TTC here, is there? Or yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, if Jim Ross is there, he's the head of operations. I want to ask you the ATC rollout, which we're all very familiar with, the city councillors automatic train control. Is, is this not one of the biggest capital projects um, that you're undertaking in? Is it where are you now right now with that initiative? Is that at Rosedale heading north on Young? Does anybody Chair, it's Rick Lear. It, Chair, it's Rick Leary. Okay, not, go uh, ahead. Would you, would you, I'm sorry, Chair. Would you ask that a question? I, I apologize. I got, got cut off on my. Just the ATC rollout on line one, which is one of the biggest line transit lines in, I think, North America. Is under is happening now. It's one of your biggest capital projects. Is it currently at Rosedale heading north on Young ATC, which has been delayed multiple times? That's correct. So right now we're working on uh, getting ATC from Rosedale up to Eglinton by the end of this year. Uh, we have about 17 weekend diversions <laughs> in place north of Saint Cl uh, north of uh, Bloor this year to uh, to get us to get ourselves there. Okay, so that would mean like from April to December, probably two thirds almost. I don't expect you to do the math, but two thirds of the weekends throughout the course of this year, the Young Street will become basically almost a shuttle system with DRTs both north and south. Is that correct? That, that is correct, yeah. Okay. Um, and so how many trains, when you when a train goes down in an emergency situation or plan, how many buses do you need to compensate? Meaning how many people sit in a bus versus a subway train? So right now a, a subway train holds 11 to 1200 people on a regular basis. I'll say, these are my pre-COVID numbers, obviously. Um, and a bus holds about 51 individuals. Again, pre-COVID, we're keeping them to 25, we tried today. So we know that what we have to do is we have to match up. And whenever an incident occurs on Young Street, we typically try to get 50 buses right away, right, to get to that location while we gauge what else we would need during the course of the, uh, the diversion. Okay, so, the situation. so that's great. I've seen it because I'm a Young Street counselor and I've witnessed it both in emergency situations because I ride the system uh, pre COVID anyway. And, um, so just when, when there's a planned diversion, it's a sea of buses. When there's an emergency diversion, uh, an emergency situation, it's a sea of people everywhere, all over young street. So how do you plan for that? How do you tackle that? Well, for the weekend diversions, we, we structure, we work with uh, transportation services. We work with uh, Toronto uh, police services to make sure that we have the, not just the, in the proper number of buses for ourselves, but we coordinate for the timings of signals, uh, as well as have detailed offices on corners, uh, like, um, you know, with uh, Mount Pleasant, for instance, to make sure that the, the buses navigate coming around onto Young Street. So it's a well coordinated. Now, when it, when it comes to an emergency, um, you know, we, we call it, Manage chaos in a sense. There are thousands of people that come out of the subway station, right? We uh, emergency emergency response crews come to the location, supervisors, buses. We actually designate buses around the system uh, on routes that should something happen that we send them right over to Young Street to, to do just that. Okay. Have you received any schematics or plans or designs related to this report uh, in order for you to plan around this or how you navigate this? I, I think that's an important piece of the puzzle here? Um, so what, what, what we've received is where they would put the uh, the cafes. Uh, we, we've uh, worked with each other and we're gonna, the intent is to share the schematics and diagrams on the street as we would also share with them the impact once we have those with uh, Barbara Gray and I've talked a number of times on this, when we would share with them the impact on the travel times for our customers and our buses, uh, whether it's during the, a regular diversion, uh, scheduled diversion or an unplanned diversion so that we can come up to good decisions together. They're gonna give okay. that information to us. Okay, to Barbara Gray, um, my concern as you know, Barbara, is surface transit really hasn't weighed in here heavily enough. I know you've spoken to Rick Larry since the report was dropped, but is there a plan to work with the TTC to look at the uh, service impacts just generally? So through the chair, absolutely, Councillor Robinson. And in fact, we actually have uh, members of the team in operations who have been sitting at the, team, at the table with our designers since 
uh, we started heading out to the BIA to have those conversations. And we are, you know, TTC is a, is a very large organization, as you are very well aware, and so there's lots of different components of it. So we've been working pretty closely with uh, Pranav Dave and his team. Uh, we've been working and talking with Kathleen uh, and with the uh, the service folks as well as with Rick just of recently to make sure that we are well coordinated. And we know that these unplanned and even the planned closures, there's a number of them this year. We're trying to be very uh, um, knowledgeable about where the impact is going to be most significant and uh, and work that as we learn where the cafes are going to be. Because that the cafes in the Cafe Pio program, we have a number of them that have already registered, will be uh, the principal use in the curbland. And that would be the expanded capacity for, for the shuttle buses. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Additional questions of staff? Councilor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. I'm going to pick up where, pick up where our TTC chair left off about um, the, with respect to TTC and Young Street. Um, last year, there were closures to do the automated transit control system, correct? That is, that is correct. I believe it was last November we brought it all the way up uh, from Queen, uh, Union Queen up to Rosedale. And did we coordinate um, the, the various patio locations that were taking on portions of the street at that point or when, when Cafe Teal was rolled out? Cafe, uh, Kathleen or Barbara, maybe you could give more specifics on, on that coordination. So I, uh, through the chair, I certainly can. We um, we have always worked uh, with all of our partners when we roll out the Cafe Teo program. We didn't have a lot of um, runway last year. As you know, we tried to get the program in place as quickly as possible, but we still did work uh, with the TTC. And there were a number of situations that we had to sort out, including uh, the distance back from intersections. In some cases, we put in some temporary asphalt ramping so that we could have a level boarding area. Uh, all issues that we would be willing to do absolutely again. And we have a little bit more time, so we're able to work through these issues uh, more collaboratively, not only with the TTC, but also with the businesses. And uh, it's Kathleen Llewellyn Thomas, if it's helpful, just to say that we had 18 closures to support that last summer. You had 18 closures last summer for a, the a, ATC? Yes, uh, At, for that distance, yeah. O overnight or weekends or? Uh, a combination, uh, council. Okay. Um, construction management hoarding. How do we manage that with respect to the ATC closures? Does does um, transportation services bring those um, hoarding closures to the TTC for comment? Um, I would. Uh... Let's see, I think I have either Roger Brown or Dave Twaddle for a specific answer on that. If you want, if you have other questions, Councillor, we can um, we can sort that out. I mean, certainly with the Cafe Teo plan, we have to look at the whole street and understand all the impacts. So when there's construction, and in some cases we haven't been able to accommodate cafes, when there's construction, uh, hoarding, when there's extended uh, transit stops, and a number of other site specific conditions. But specifically about how we route it, um, I, I will find out about that. If you have other questions, I'm happy to answer those in the, in the meantime. Great. Well, one one is more more quali qualitative. How you, you've initiated discussions with the BIAs and residents associations along the corridor. How how have they responded? Uh, for the for the Midtown cycling and uh, complete streets component, they've been extremely positive. Actually, we've been out to a couple of meetings. Jacqueline's been there with her team, Jacqueline and Becky. Um, it's not only been BIAs, but also resident associations that have participated in those conversations. Uh, very supportive, very interested, uh, some concern, as, as there always is, about potential traffic infiltration, the changes to the streets. So just giving you sort of the full range of comments that we received. But overall, uh, a very, very positive uh, re reaction. Um, on the um, on the lakeshore front, can you please uh, just just outline why you're making the recommendation you are, and if you see that there is a possibility that we may uh, indeed find a resolution that would uh, either allow temporary closures of lakeshore when um, other capacity exists, or an alteration to lakeshore that may allow us to widen the pedestrian domain in that location to allow for some, some kind of um, some kind of alternative active TO installation along that stretch. 
Yeah, thank you uh, for the question, Councillor Layton. So uh, I'll just start off by saying the report indicates, and we are we are happy to look for opportunities to um, reinstall the uh, Lakeshore West Active PO closure this year, depending on uh, other events that are happening. You know, we're well, we still have lower traffic volume, so we're committed to looking for some opportunities this, this summer. Um, we have to provide the data on all sides of the equation, right? So when we looked at the significant amount of people who were accommodated by the Akashio Lakeshore West closure, it was definitely the most popular of all the ones that we did. Um, it also had some impact on, uh, on vehicular traffic on the Gardner. We want you to know that. The other compounding factor this year is we have some very important capital infrastructure work on the King Queen Roncesvalles uh, 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 streetcar route that's been uh, delayed for a couple of years now and absolutely has to get done. It's a two-year program. It is going to impact uh, the relief corridors that were in place last year, even though the traffic volumes were lower. And so there will be an impact on the network, and we, we have to make that clear that there will be an impact on the network. And in, in, the, um, in the report, we've tried to be as clear as we can about that. Uh, and I think uh, we certainly will be able to find some options in, earlier in the season, test it out and see how it works. That would be our proposal. Okay, uh, um, I, I just have uh, one we last can line of questions. Do, about we can do a what is planned. second round um, in case others have questions, if okay. that's okay. Because um, I think there, there's a lot of questions. My next round may get covered. My, okay. okay. Uh, Councillor Pasternak. Great, thank you, um, Madam, through, Madam Chair, through you to, to staff. I'm on, on page 13, and I guess it's focusing on the quiet streets. Um, at one point, you say it's not expected the quiet streets will be required in spring, summer 2021 to enable physical distancing for those walking and cycling on local streets. And then on the next page, you say several routes are proposed for implement, implementation in 2021. And there's a list. Um, there's a list of, of potential streets. So, I, I just want to get clarity. On one hand, you seem to be saying we're not really doing quiet streets anymore because they're no longer required. And then on the next page, you list off a, a number of potential locations for quiet streets. Is quiet streets a go in 2021 or or not? Uh, to the Chair, we are not proposing doing the Quiet Streets program uh, this year like we did last year. Um, we had um, a lot of really positive experiences. Uh, we did a fair amount of surveying of the communities where we put Quiet Streets in place and a number of um, concerns that people had. Uh, we are uh, happy to work as we do with local traffic calming projects with communities who would like to do something this year. Um, one of the things that happened last year in order to accommodate those programs is we did shift staff away from other very important programs, including area transportation planning, traffic counting, uh, things that have been uh, missed in terms of the ability to get those programs and their results out on the street. Those staff are back in their base programs this year, and so it gives us limited capacity to roll out the components of quiet streets that we did uh, last year. So we are, we're happy to engage with communities and councillors who wanna do a couple of streets here and there. We're, we're happy to try to figure out how to make that work and we're working through that proposal right now. So thank you for that. So if we are proceeding, um, I, see, I see the lessons learned, sort of. Um, how, would you, how would you synthesize, um, and, and I know there's some good in the program, but clearly we have to fix what didn't work. What, what would you just say, what would you say you would, you would fix or change for 2021? So uh, through the chair, uh, Councilor Pasternak, we went to a lot of places where we thought uh, the connectivity to parks and locations where there was sort of lack of green space to give people the option to do physical distancing. Um, some of those were really well supported and others were not. And so uh, also we used materials that I think were temporary in nature. Some of that again worked fine and others did not work fine. People moved the barrels. Uh, they weren't necessarily interested in having the streets closed in that way or, or limited access for local access only. So um, we've had some good examples where we actually worked collaboratively with our street art program to uh, to get local artists or public artists to work on some uh, more durable solutions. 
Um, and so we have some of those facilities that, that still exist, uh, which we would we would um, potentially be able to use this year. But again, it would be at a very smaller scale. So I would call it local traffic calming. We also have uh, proposals in the cycling implementation plan that take some of those successful quiet streets and try to move them into a more uh, durable uh, implementation. So, I mean, I had two locations, two large streets in my ward that were quiet streets. and and the response was was mixed um i found that people didn't really understand the program um and how it was to operate in the future are we going to do anything more on the education side to alert people to actually how these programs operate so we did a fair amount of education both before and after uh the program before during and after but uh, certainly there's always more that that needs to be done on these larger scale programs um, and again, uh, we are we are not able to take on the scale of a program like we did last year. Um, and I, I do think that um, you know the survey demonstrated, as you described, mixed reviews uh, in areas where we think local traffic calming would be effective. We would uh, can, we'll continue to work on it in terms of local traffic calming as an approach. Um, and certainly, there are a couple of locations where we already know that people are interested in, in having some kind of installation. So, do you think there's a, a downtown uh, orientation to um, active TO, or do you think it's there's equity across the city that that, that uh, um, all yeah. for the major road closures? Would you say? Are you asking? Well, for I'm just, the whole yeah, program? I guess I guess that's part of it. Although I don't know if the inner suburbs would support major road closures, uh, but I, no, I, I think... see where the local. I, I, I see it's a it's. Very much a downtown program. Is that going to change over the years, or I wouldn't characterize it as, as a downtown program. I think what we tried to do was to provide extra capacity for physical distancing and recreation on uh, long existing trail corridors and existing roadways and adjacent parks, places where we had lots of uh, people who would be interested in utilizing those. And I think we saw they were very successful and and quite successful in and around downtown. Um, we had uh, cycling infrastructure through Active Tio temporary across the city. Um, certainly more of it was focused in the downtown than in, in the inner suburbs, but we definitely had installations across across the city. And we are very interested, as the report identified, in approaching some other corridors for major road closures to pilot and test those out. We have a couple that we would like to use in consultation with local councillors. So the Allen Road, Black Creek Drive, a number of them have been mentioned. The best ones are those where we don't have lots of intersections, but we have limited access roadways. So we'll be out to talk to you about that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there additional questions of staff? I know Councillor Leighton may have had another question. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the area that you identified for, sorry, I'll start the clock. Um, you identified um, a section of Young for the pilot. Can you just speak to what those criteria were and why you're not recommending north of that? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. So we are recommending an approach from Bloor to Davisville. I believe we were asked by Council to look all the way north to Lawrence. There's a number of reasons why we would not recommend uh, a pilot uh, this year north of Davisville, in part because the uh, extent of that, uh, of that stretch is way more than we can actually accomplish. But I would also say that north of Davisville on Young Street, you run into the Edmonton construction. There's a number of other major construction projects there as well. Um, we also have uh, a network that's a little bit more expanded north of Davisville and has a couple of other alternatives. So we would want to be looking at what the best route is north of there. It may or may not be Young Street. It might be one of the other connectors. And there's other work to do in order to bring those recommendations forward. Um, we also know that there's uh, there's a fair amount of uh, Cafe Tio activity that uh, is happening south of there. Uh, but there's also a little bit north of there. I think one of the biggest challenges is the Edmonton construction and other construction projects. Um, Lakeshore West, um, you've, you've heard that people are obviously disappointed that there won't be the same um, number of closures of Lakeshore West, but um, if, if you were to think creatively, might you be able to identify a few opportunities along there either for limited weekends or just uh, several lanes? Like, Is it possible for uh, you to maybe give some more thought to this and come up with some recommendations? 
Yes, absolutely. We're happy to do that. Um, I, we just needed to flag that there will be impact. We believe there will be impact. And uh, we also know that there was very widespread use of the Lakeshore West Corridor. So we're happy to try it. And we have, um, we're all set up to do counts. So we will be able to understand specifically what those impacts are. And we can monitor that traffic and bring that information back. So we can certainly test it out. Um, and then my final question, there were several deputants that spoke to Overly Bridge and it was mentioned that consultation is starting. Can you please just um, reiterate when, it, when would that be? Yeah, thank you. So we have a plan to do community consultation early in the summer, like starting in June, to talk about the, the broader program. We've actually been involved, um, I believe the, the meeting that was identified through the, um, the speakers is one that, that uh, Jacqueline Hayward attended. We had staff there. Um, we've, we've looked at some of the preliminary uh, proposals, the architect's drawing, so we, we're happy to come and meet with the community oh, sooner than June, but June is when we're planning on going out and starting this program. We, we do know that the bridge, if it's going to be expanded, needs to uh, be reconstructed, and so that's a longer-term plan, but, you know, in the, in the, within the next five to, to seven years is the plan, so we would have to do community consultation around that, and we're happy to engage with the community. Uh, sooner if that's, uh, if that's required or, or desired. So this is, is a work in progress and you are also investigating some short-term mitigation that could be done as well in advance of that larger infrastructure project? Yes, we, we are. I mean, the, the bridge will need to be redone in order to have more uh, capacity for pedestrians, wider sidewalks, that type of thing. It, it can't... Um, it can't manage um, the, the additional capacity with, with uh, as far as we've examined. Um, it also has a fair amount of traffic and a transit lane. So it's challenging, um, as I think some of the counselors mentioned, there's a fair amount of uh, activity on that bridge as well in the roadway. And so we just need to be careful that we're managing it um, uh, consistently. The traffic volumes are actually pretty high. Uh, but certainly we are happy to go out and work with the, the community to figure out if there's anything else we can do short term. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Councillor Cole, five minutes. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I uh, just wanted to ask, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the rationale of not going north of uh, Eglinton uh, is because of the construction uh, at Eglinton, uh, and I can see that. Uh, as you know, I've uh, prepared a motion which would uh, look at the feasibility of uh, maybe uh, doing a standalone uh, continuation of uh, bike lanes uh, north of uh, Eglinton to Lawrence uh, uh, in the meantime, so we don't lose momentum on it, uh, you know, uh, contingent on, fa uh, you know, staff availability and resources, et cetera. Uh, is there any real problem in uh, continuing to uh, look at uh, the future of a bikeway north of uh, Eglinton uh, as a standalone? Uh, thank you, Councillor Cole. The, uh, we're happy to look at an extension in future years. I think the idea is that we would um, we would start to consult on that. Uh, there's a little bit more work that needs to be done in order to come back with a recommendation as to which quarter is the appropriate one. Uh, we certainly can't, we don't have the staff capacity to do more than what we have identified this year. Um, and again, as I mentioned, the construction impacts are, we believe, not um, not to, desired to be able to have second infrastructure in that location uh, during the construction on Eglinton, but we're happy to look at uh, a program in, uh, in, in the future. Yeah, I guess I, I'm wondering the future. What do you mean by future? Uh, I think we've got great momentum. And we've got this urgent situation with the uh, pandemic uh, impacting us profoundly, and it's going to impact us profoundly for uh, uh, the next year or two for sure. Uh, so uh, what are we going to do to uh, deal with that uh, reality of people uh, needing to walk and cycle uh, in the pandemic in the meantime? Uh, so we, we will be coming back to the council in July of this year with a report that looks at the implementation for the next three years. Um, and so we would be looking, we would, we would indicate the timing. We still have a little bit more work to do to be able to indicate the timing and commit to a timing. So I'm not going to be able to commit to, to any timing here today, but we will certainly be bringing this back as part of that July report. Uh, and we'll have more information to share at that time. Yeah, and in terms of resourcing uh, this, uh, these studies, which are very important, uh, 
you know, with the announcement of the uh, $400 million uh, from uh, the Minister of the Infrastructure and Communities, uh, Catherine McKenna, March 12th, uh, we have $400 million that are allocated towards uh, building and improving uh, pathways and bikeways throughout Canada. Can we not access some of that uh, money so we could uh, basically uh, deploy more staff uh, to uh, do these uh, studies? Well, um, certainly, Councillor, we are in active conversations with uh, both the city manager's office and our partners at the TTC about, and, and uh, to talk about where, what projects are the best capital projects to look at uh, utilizing that resource for. Um, so we'll continue to have those conversations. Um, it, it, it may be staff, but more importantly, I think there are some significant capital programs that are pretty high dollar items that we find are the best fits for some of those uh, partnership programs with other orders of government and their funding. Yes, and, and I guess the, the thing is, is there a, sort of a uh, an emergency urgent plan that dealing with the pandemic uh, I know that uh, there's long-term capital uh, investments, et cetera, but given the reality of this pandemic that is uh, really impacting us on a daily basis and is going to do so, do we have an emergency plan in place to deal with the, the dramatic changes in transportation where the TTC's got, what, 50, 60% drop off in uh, riders. Uh, we've got uh, less uh, car traffic. Uh, but we have an explosion of cycling uh, taking place all over the city uh, for many reasons and pedestrian uh, movement. So is there an emergency uh, plan to deal with this uh, pandemic reality? Well, I think that our existing plans anticipated growth in all of those networks, right? We anticipated a uh, huge investment in Vision Zero for safer uh, areas for pedestrians. We envisioned the 10-year cycling plan implementation and try to advance that as quickly as we can and leverage those resources. The other piece that we brought forward uh, is the Surface Transit Network Plan, or Rapid TO, where that looks at uh, moving forward with surface transit to support uh, especially people who are still taking the bus and are in some of the outer suburbs who need that fast and reliable connection. So we've been contributors also to the city manager's work on the TOR report or the uh, Office of Recovery and Rebuild report. Um, so I think our existing plans and, and accelerating our existing plans and getting feedback from the community on if there anything needs to change there is, is our approach and we'll continue to move forward with that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any additional questions of staff? And Councillor Leighton, you had said maybe a second round were your questions answered? I believe my questions around Overly and Lakeshore were answered. I think I was still waiting for an answer about um, coordinating construction projects and um, the TTC buses and if that work is done. So uh, thank you, Councillor Layton. It is, in fact, we do share uh, those plans with our uh, our uh, colleagues at the TTC and try to make sure that we can uh, enable stop locations. And in many cases, it has to do with the stop location. Dave Twaddle's on the line. If he has anything more specific to add, there. Yeah. Good morning. I was just going to say that uh, you know before any new construction boarding is put in place. We certainly have a conversation with the TTC because there can be some impacts on their service. Sometimes they have to add buses or streetcars to the network, so they need to be involved in, in that discussion. So we certainly do that before any hoarding takes up lane waste uh, on the road. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, seeing no additional questions of staff, we will move to speakers, uh, outside speakers first, uh, Councillor Robinson. Thank, uh, thank you, um, Madam Speaker, and um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak today. I just, I'm a little bit concerned about uh, the Young Street initiative. Uh, I love the cafes. Uh, those are static, but the bicycle lanes aren't. And I'm just a little bit concerned about this concept of cafes, bicycle lanes, and then uh, two thirds of the following weekends in 2021, having basically shuttle buses. And again, if you don't, if you haven't seen it, it's a sight to see 
the way this is orchestrated, where there's a million buses heading north and south, um, trying to navigate a difficult situation. And you heard the numbers from the uh, CEO of the TTC. To replace a subway takes hundreds of buses. And that's my worry about Young Street and this program. Although I think, you know, the program has a many, many, many merits. So I understand the um, chair has a motion uh, that I think is great. It's going to allow us to do a deeper dive uh, between now and city council to look at service impacts for the TTC, which carries, uh, again, more riders than any other network piece in all of North America. I think there might be one in New York City that beats us, but I think it's not a number of routes coming into it. So I think for single, a single line, it is the busiest in North America. And this is a record setting year for subway closures on line one, because the ATC is being rolled out. It's something I fought for. Andy Byford promised me it would be done at a public meeting in 2017. And here we are 2021 still trying to get this ATC rolled out. So I want to make sure it doesn't impact delays. Um, there's nothing more important than moving riders around our city, partic particularly post COVID, because I think the TTC will play a major role in our recovery. Um, and right now we're at Rosedale heading north. So this ATC, the signaling upgrade project is critical to the city. Uh, it's the backbone of the city. It carries people to uh, their places of work, to play, to live. And there will be 40 days of full weekend closures and 84 days of early access closures to the total of about 124 planned closure days on line on young, the young line. So I witnessed this myself multiple times uh, as a Young Street counselor. I go out to Young Street. I see this unfold. I've been in the, you know, the emergency closures multiple times because that's how I get around the city is the TTC and had to be kicked off the subway and onto Young Street. And there's pictures of that too, where you can't see anything but humans. And I just want to make sure we've got this right. I don't agree. I, I don't think we've done a deep enough dive here on surface transit. And I know for a fact, because when I met with transportation staff February 22nd about this, uh, they did not have the closure schedule in front of them. And, and I can tell you that because we sent it to them, our office. So I think surface transit has to weigh in here. I know that the, you were looking at a number of north-south connectors, uh, Avenue Road, Mount Pleasant, Young. And I just think Young Street has to be prioritized because it's the busiest transit corridor has to be prioritized and so um i appreciate very much the chair putting forward this motion that will allow us over the next few weeks to get more information from the ttc i know barbara gray and rick leary have had conversations since the report dropped but that's not good enough i think the ttc is a major stakeholder in toronto and we need to be consulted about how we maneuver you know the, the turns for the buses etc um, but what we don't want to do is create a more dangerous situation and I, I certainly hope we're not. So I think this analysis will, by the time we get to city council, hopefully we'll have more information on this and understand the full impacts of this. I just want to say quickly in my last few minutes, because I feel I must on the Overlea Bridge, there is a plan. It's been being planned for many, many years. It's a multi-million dollar project. Uh, consultation will happen this year. And I will tell you, Thorncliffe Park is very sensitive about consultation very sensitive often in the past they have been completely cut out and not had a voice so consultation in thorncliffe park is critical and doing it virtually is extremely challenging and un unfair quite frankly but we probably because the pandemic continues to go on we will probably have to do it that way ideally it would be amazing to do it post pandemic where we could gather in a, a gymnasium which we barely have in thorncliffe park that's another issue about amenities in thorncliffe park so people could really participate fully, but it's an important uh, initiative. It's underway. And I want to give the students of Mark Berno that thumbs up. Uh, thank you for your input, but we are working on this plan and, and fast tracking as best we can. There is a queue in the city and we're in the queue. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. Additional speakers? Uh, Councillor Pasternak, followed by Councillor Cole. Yes, no, thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam Chair. I would simply say that 
you know, when it comes to uh, active TO, it was it was generally a, a, a pretty good success uh, in uh, in York Center uh, Ward Six, where historically um, bike lanes and sharing street space had not gone over uh, very well. But I think we have to understand that uh, roads roads are to be shared. Um, we host uh, two major street festivals, as well as there's dozens across the street in which roads are shared. We host uh, Taste of Manila and Walk for, for Israel. Of course, across the city, there's marathons, there's fundraisers, there's all kinds of uh, celebrations. Uh, we're moving into patios and parklets, and of course, uh, cycling. So I think, I think it, it, that is healthy for, for a growing city. Uh, that that we're actually sharing the roads, but at the same time, uh, there's no harm in keeping in mind that roads also are also used um, by ambulances, by fire trucks, by police, uh, by regular motorists, by TTC vehicles, um, and and in commerce to get uh, goods to and from uh, stores and and different outlets. So it it keeps the economy uh, going as well. So as we move forward, it's very important. That if we're going to be sharing our road space, whether it be uh, cycling, whether it be um, quiet streets in the future, if we can make it work a little better, uh, whether it be more and more events, once it is safe to do so, we have to keep the public informed of what we're doing, uh, the time frames, uh, the potential uh, potential impact. And I think you know, Torontonians are reasonable people. Uh, they they understand that, um, that these big events or ongoing smaller events are crucial to the livability, uh, prosperity of our city. And that only by sharing the roads um, can, can really we under, understand and get to the place we, we want to be, where everyone can be healthier uh, and, and safer. So active TO is not just a physical engineering uh, initiative um, on the ground. It, it represents a paradigm shift uh, for, for the city. Where, where our streets become open to everybody in, in a safe and welcoming way. And I think that is really the key takeaway uh, from, from the initiative that started last year and will we'll continue to move forward, um, you know, in, in a slightly different form uh, this year. So I thank staff uh, for this report. Um, certainly, I think going forward, um, the, 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 uh, the report is, is entitled Lessons Learned. I think there were some lessons learned. And certainly when we learn lessons, we can create better policy uh, in the future for all Torontonians. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'm just waiting for the screen to change. Additional speakers. Councillor Cole. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, our transportation staff has been uh, working uh, above and beyond uh, expectations uh, given the, the pandemic and all the uh, demands upon it and uh, you know and we keep on asking them to do more and so it is just remarkable they've been able to achieve what they have with this breakthrough on uh, uh, our uh, uh, cycling uh, infrastructure uh, pedestrian safety vision zero the incredible success of the lakeshore uh, bikeway uh, so it's, uh, and I think it's been uh, accelerated because of the uh, ugly pandemic uh, uh, that's uh, hit our city and hit every city in the world. Uh, I, I just uh, think that, uh, uh, you know, you know, it's great to look about recovery and the future in which we all, you know, look forward to. The reality is this thing is not going away. So uh, I remember in the early days of the pandemic, oh, it's going to be a month. Oh, it's going to be six months. This is here for a long time. And, uh, you know, vaccines or not, this, you know, this thing continues. Uh, and it's, we have to ensure that we uh, uh, recognize the uh, uh, impact of this pandemic for the months and uh, maybe years ahead in our transportation planning. You know, people have changed the way they get around the city. Uh, some of it's been uh, beneficial. You can see there's less traffic uh, because of the uh, work at home uh, phenomena, or, you know, it's, it's estimated by 
uh, the CIBC, 50% of all uh, work is now done from home. Our, uh, you know, our TTC buses and uh, subway cars, uh, uh, I've seen a dramatic drop off, uh, never seen in the history of this city. And uh, so there are changes that, that uh, are taking place in our city where people are walking a lot more, they're cycling a lot more. They're they're uh, out in baby carriages everywhere. It's uh, so we have to adapt to this reality of the transportation uh, shift that's taking place. And one of the things we've done as a city is we put in our uh, cycle. We accelerated our cycling infrastructure across the city. We, we've uh, focused in on quiet streets, calm streets, uh, and uh, we've also had the patios on our streets. Uh, which have been a phenomenal success in terms of keeping business alive. Uh, who would have thought in Toronto? I remember they used to be uh, almost uh, uh, fistfights breaking out uh, over uh, the patios that first went on, uh, you know, with their liquor license on our main streets. You know, there used to be hundreds of people coming to community meetings. Well, we can't allow people to have a beer or eat a, on the main street. Uh, that was on the sidewalks, uh, and now this past year we saw people eating, drinking, uh, uh, social, having coffee on a street. Wow, what a uh, revolutionary thing! Uh, but it happened, and it was a great success, despite the uh, obvious uh, challenges it poses, and it's not easy. Uh, so, but, but we did that, but we can't lose the momentum. Uh, and not think that this thing is over. And that's why I'm uh, trying to I have a motion uh, before uh, us uh, today to try and uh, ensure that we don't lose the momentum on Young Street north of Eglinton, that we continue to study and look at the ways of implementing cycling lanes north of Young to Lawrence and look at alternatives. And But we've got to continue that uh, investigation. We, we can't say it's going to be done in three years. Uh, because the reality is people uh, want to see the cafes, they want to see the cycling, they want to see pedestrian safety on Young Street where uh, there's uh, great opportunities to calm the street, make it safer, and at the same time help business. And so that's why my motion, and my motion I'm calling for a uh, feasibility study to see if we can proceed with the study on Young Street north of Eglinton uh, because right now we've got the subway construction on Eglinton and Young, but that's going to take two or three more years because they've got a huge problem uh, trying to connect the Eglinton cross town with the Young. They, they've uh, really run across major roadblocks, so we can't wait for that to be solved in two or three, four years when they finish that mess there. So let's look at uh, calming uh, Young Street uh, north of Eglinton. Uh, so we can deal with the uh, new realities of transportation in Toronto. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there additional speakers? Councillor Layton, five minutes. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and thank you in advance for the motion that uh, you've pre-circulated and for um, uh, putting many of the items that I think would have ended up uh, as motions from others uh, all together and uh, incorporating some feedback uh, into into those. You know, what, what we're in and this Councillor Cole said this a couple of times. Um, what we deem as safe is is changing in our city and, and with relation to our streets. Um, in the in, in the time I've been on council, we've seen the tolerance for uh, for tra trading off safety and convenience shift quite dramatically, in, in, in my opinion. And this is an extremely positive thing because it's putting the best interest of members of our community and the safety of those community put over our, our, our own. And I think that that's really important to recognize. And as a result, on the projects that, that often we're seeing the most contentious, they are now the gold standard for how we're looking at uh, at other parts of our of uh, of our of, of changing other parts of our city. The 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 small well, starting with a, a project the deputy mayor knows well, uh, 
Richmond, Adelaide, and the uh, the transformation that uh, uh, that that has had to our cycling grid led to a much larger cycling grid, uh, perhaps much to uh, the the members' chagrin, uh, but but led to a much uh, much bigger cycling grid of protected lanes uh, across the city, and really helped um, normalize this notion that. Uh, cycling isn't just for a, a, a handful. It, it, it is part of our transportation solution going forward. And then you layer on the vision zero piece that if, if you remember just a couple of years ago, the carnage that was on our streets, the road violence that we had uh, and, and just how fast our communities were demanding us to act. And it took a little bit of time, perhaps it wasn't as fast as uh, as as many would have liked, but but slowly we're starting to change that uh, um, that uh, and 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 challenging some of I think the 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 assumptions people make about what changes to our roads uh, can have and what what um, that that the uh, the the negative aspects will outweigh uh, the positives. Uh, just very quickly going through some of a, a huge kudos to staff for moving so quickly last year on these items. I remember having some conversations with our general manager before the initiation of active TO, um, and she was really uh, in, interested in moving it forward quickly. Um, I was skeptical that it could be done that quickly, uh, but they delivered, and, um, and, 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 and a huge goes to them and their team for changing uh, so quickly and for adapting. Um, on the Young Street closure, you know, this is something that I don't think was in the discussions just a couple of years ago, but, uh, but because of the success we've seen elsewhere, uh, I think words getting around that this is something that communities would like to see. You know, Young Street uh, is seen as um, a transportation uh, corridor for those that live outside of the neighborhood. But for those that live in the neighborhood, they know that it, it lives and breathes like a like a main street, like a res, uh, uh, like a main street style street where people are walking, people are engaging in there with the storefronts. It's much more than a way or or a, a space to travel through. It's much more of a space locally to, to, to encourage uh, circulation. We're able to do that through Active Young, both encourage the circulation of vehicles <clears throat> as well as the safe uh, circulation of, uh, of people and add to it this, um, this dynamic of, of economic activity um, that you get from, um, from taking over some of the street space uh, for, for patios and other, and other endeavors like that. Um, on Lakeshore, we saw this was a hugely hugely popular route. And that's why I'm happy that the chair is bringing forward a motion um, that will help staff continue uh, and give staff very direct direction to continue to find ways to try to make Lakeshore work um, if it's taking over some of the lanes, if it's doing it some weekends. Um, it, th this is something that we've seen great success with both on Lakeshore and other parts of, uh, of the city. Bayview is another great example. Um, let's try to see what can be done here. It was so important last year. I attended on a number of occasions and, and very much enjoyed it with my family. Um, let's see what we can do here and, and make sure that this is a reality. On quiet streets, um, there's a, a part of the motion that will speak to that. And I hope that you'll support it because this is something I think that we should give very direct um, direction to staff to, uh, to continue. Um, it, it sounds like there's a conversation going on around Overly. I wish it was happening faster for the sake of those uh, of those constituents, those parents, students, and, and administrators. It sounds like it's moving forward. Um, I, I hope that we hear more about that in the very near future and to the lo two local city councillors. I'm sure you'll have an endorsement of all of city staff if you need to accelerate that work in, in any which way um, or fashion you need done. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Minin Wong. Yeah, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, do clerk's office have my slides? I don't want them yet, but I sent them a couple of slides. No, they do not. This morning. They're I checking. sent it to I, the IEC. Um, They're searching for it right now. Okay. Um, if they can, I, you know, I don't know if there are any other speakers, Madam Chair. Those, they're I mean, I sent them early this morning. Um, I, I mean, I can speak after you, but I'd like to speak and I'd like to show those slides. They don't see it. Um, can you resend it? Sure. Hold on just one sec.
Anyway, you know what? I will try and and, and um, go without them. Uh, just hold on a sec. Um, okay, so uh, Madam Chair, I'm not supporting this report extensively because of putting bike lanes on Young Street. So we are. Yeah, this report is supporting taking 50% of the road capacity out along one of the most traveled subway lines in North America with no data and no information about its impacts. One of the few roads in the center of Toronto that runs from our northern boundary, boundary directly down to the lake. And our response is to defer this decision on the impacts to staff. What I do know from talking to the TTC CEO is that when the TTC breaks down, our transit riders feel confusion, anger, and delay. It's bedlam or managed chaos, as the TTC CEO said today. A typical ride that takes 30 minutes would now take 90 minutes. And if we take one lane of traffic out, 50% capacity, what then? Another hour delay, two and a half hours, and in the winter, even longer when those, bus those bike lanes are empty. If that's not madness, I don't know what is. And what about those cyclists? How many of them will actually use this route as their primary mode of travel? So the, sl the slides I wanted to show you, I, I, uh, I have some research. I did a survey of 517 people in my ward. Primary mode of travel, 61% in cars, 20% in public transit. On bike lanes, take bikes, 2%. 2% of those people use bikes. But let's say twice as many people. We, and so, so then the next question is, would you, so they'll say, oh, you put the bike lanes in, would you, you know, there's going to be more cyclists. We asked that question too. Would you cycle more frequently for your regular travel if there were no bicycle lanes? 66% said no. 17%, only 17% said yes. And of those, uh, there are the you know fitness club uh, people who say, if I got you a fitness club membership, would you go to the gym? Half of those people would never go. So the number is even lower. So let's say that maybe twice as many people, that's only 4%. 4% of, of people would use it. That's the margin of error. We are inconveniencing the remaining road users and transit users for this small number of cyclists. So this, in my view, is fundamentally the wrong thing to do. What we need to do is change course in the implementation of these bike lanes and others that don't make sense, that don't make common sense. In my ward, separated bike lanes were put in a couple, couple of years ago in the Flemington community. Two years later, we counted the number of cyclists that used the bike lanes during the morning rush hour. There were there was one every 15 minutes during a sunny, warm day in early July. Will the transportation department consider removing these useless bike lanes? Not a chance, because once these lanes are installed, there are no metrics for measuring their success or identifying failure. I'm saddened by what we're putting in place. City staff are rushing as fast as they can to put in separated bike lanes before the pandemic ends. The outcome post pandemic will be a disaster for other road users. Congestion will increase and it will be harder to move around this city. The only difference in this report is that it, in this report by putting them, putting these bike lanes on Young Street is that it doesn't just hurt families and businesses that need the road for travel in cars and delivery trucks. This report hurts transit riders too. So I'm not voting for it, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think we've heard from any everybody that wanted to speak. Did anybody else want to speak to this item? Okay. I will speak to this item. I have a motion.
Uh, the motion is to request the general manager of transportation services to investigate in consultation with local councillors and report directly to the April 7th and 8th council meeting on a opportunity to accommodate Lakeshore Boulevard West active TO partial or full closures on select weekends or uh, consider alternate active TO installation similar to Bayview Avenue and that was a friendly amendment that last component from Councillor Layton thank you for that opportunities for additional active TO locations including the exhibition place grounds and see op opportunities to accelerate traffic calming in local neighborhoods through the refocused efforts mentioned in the report in creating enhanced quiet streets based on lessons learned in 2020 as well as opportunities for quiet neighborhoods approach where appropriate uh, the second speaks to some of the issues that have been identified by TTC Chair uh, Robinson today, and that is requesting that the General Manager Transportation Services work with the CEO of TTC to identify any potential impacts to transit customers using shuttle buses during TTC closures, the automatic train control rollout, and the proposed Young Midtown Complete Street pilot with intention paid to Young Street north of St. Clair and to report directly to the April 7th and 8th City Council meeting on opportunities to mitigate the impact on transit customers. Um, the first motion about active TO is in response to, um, I, I think, you know, how successful it was last year, and we've heard from residents about uh, how much that was enjoyed. Across the city, active TO last year, which was intended to be a quick start program for physical distancing, uh, was incredibly successful as detailed in this report. 92% uh, of people that used active TO enjoyed it. 29% uh, of them were new cyclists or those that had just recently taken back up cycling again. And at its peak, 36,000 people participated on a weekend closure. Um, I'm excited that city staff are propose, proposing more this year. I'm hopeful that they can find some opportunities in Lakeshore West that also does recognize, though, the very important work that needs to be done in the um, KQQR intersection, which will also improve uh, community safety. So it's important that that project takes place as well. Um, Unfortunately, I'm not prepared to support Councillor's motion at this time. Uh, staff have said that they don't recommend uh, the pilot on this portion of the street, and they did look at that. Um, they have said that they need to focus their efforts on to the July report back. Um, it's important that we give them the time and space to implement the project that we are recommending here today as well, and we don't want to dilute those efforts. Um, but importantly, I think we need to look at the information that's coming from the report back from TTC on closures at the April 7th meeting, and I think that will allow us to make a more informed decision on uh, matters that are north of St. Clair. Um, I'd like to thank staff for the extensive amount of work that they have done on this initiative. Thank all the deputants that came out today, including those from Mark Barneau. Um, one of my favorite things is when we do have uh, students that come and speak at the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. I, the one silver lining that I'm able to find in these virtual meetings is that we are um, hearing from more residents across the city. Uh, they aren't having to commute uh, down here to give those deputations. So um, I'm very happy that, that we heard from the students today and that staff have said that they have a strong commitment to the next steps of consultation and, and trying to whatever extent they could identify short-term measures implementing those. Um, thank you again um, to the deputies as well as all of those that sent in written submissions on this item. So with that, we will move to the votes on the motions. The motion from Council Cole will be first. It's on the screen. Recorded vote. Recorded vote requested. On the, on the motion by Councillor Cole, motion one by Councillor Cole, all in favor? Councillor Layton, Councillor Cole, Councillor Pasternak, sorry, Councillor Peruzza. All opposed? Councillor Manil, or Deputy Mayor Manilwong, Councillor Pasternak, Chair McKelvey, Madam Chair, the, the vote is uh, three to three, and that does not carry on a tie.
Okay, thank you. Uh, the next motions are from myself. We'll pull those up. So we want to vote on each one as different. Okay, uh, we'll vote on the first one, uh, requesting the general manager to report back on um, some opportunities for active TO. All those in favor? Uh, I believe that was unanimous. Uh, the next item is the report back from the CEO of TTC on any potential impacts to transit users. All those in favor? Oh, did you want to pull it on screen first? Here we go. Just waiting for the screen to change. All those in favor? All those opposed? That item also carries. Item as amended? All those in favor? All those opposed? That item carries. Okay, thank you. That brings us to item 20.13 cycling network plan, 2021 cycling infrastructure installation, first quarter update. There are four registered deputants. The first one is Katie Butler. Do we have Katie on the line? Good. Thank yes, you. Sam. Thank you, Chair McKelvey. You have five minutes. I'm a lawyer at Borden Ladner Gervais, and I represent Asaria Medical Corporation. Dr. Asaria is a medical director at the out of hospital clinic located at 251 Davenport Road. He, he requests that recommendation 2F and attachment three of the general manager's report dated March 9th, 2021, res respecting adjustment of cycle tracks along Davenport Road from DuPont to Young Street be amended to retain the parking on the south side rather than the north side of Davenport Road between Bedford and Avenue Road. In the alternative, we request that recommendation 2F be deferred today. My client participated in the consultation and I submitted a letter to the committee dated March 22nd, showing a map of the Bedford to Avenue segment of Davenport Road. And I also showed in my letter a cross section of what the current street design as proposed looks like compared to what my client would propose be changed. And to be clear, the number and size of lanes for bikes, vehicles, transit, and parking would not change in my client's proposal. The only change that my client requests is that the parking that you're keeping be the parking on the south side in this segment of Davenport Road. This is what's best for this community for three reasons. First, the south side, having parking on the south side, would afford better con continuity of parking over the next five years as compared to the north side, which is redeveloping and is scheduled to experience more interruptions for construction staging. Second, there are more commercial uses on the south side and those uses depend on street parking. The majority of the north side uses are residential with on-site parking and they're less reliant on on-street parking in any event. The south side by contrast has a number of medical clinics, including my clients, and other essential businesses. For example, my client's clinic, it's an essential business on the south side that sees an average of 45 to 50 patients a day, six days a week, and that's during lockdown. That's a lot, and that's certainly more than the number of people you'd expect to see at a residence every day, six days a week. And that's just from one of these businesses on the south side. Now consider that there are more businesses on the south side than on the north side that depend on street parking and have many patrons daily. There are other essential businesses, including a physiotherapy clinic on the same segment of Davenport. Patrons for all of these south side businesses who need parking would be required under the current proposal to park across the street, cross Davenport Road in order to access their facilities. It is 260 meters between the closest signalized intersections on this part of Davenport Road. And poor placement of parking and long distances between signalized intersections can lead to pedestrian jaywalking. According to the Office of the Chief Coroner for Ontario's review of all accidental pedestrian deaths in Ontario in 2010, mid-block crossings accounted for 31% of pedestrian deaths that year. 
The review concluded that the way that we engineer the and design city streets should be implemented to reduce that number. In a way, for example, to include parking in a spot that is closer to the businesses that most need it. So we know that mid-block engineering is connected to addressing pedestrian deaths, and we know that impractical design could lead to increase in pedestrian jaywalking. So these considerations are vital when you're deciding which side of the road to keep the parking on. It's not just a practical or convenience issue here, this is a safety issue. Given the number of high patron traffic and essential businesses on the south side of this segment of Davenport Road, keeping the parking spaces on the north side as proposed could lead to pedestrian jaywalking and introduce a safety issue for all users when Vision Zero is trying to reduce all road deaths and incidents and keep everyone safe. Third, proximity of parking is higher priority for patients and patrons of the businesses on the south side. In the in addition to its other patients, my client's clinic administers general anesthesia to about five surgical patients every day for OHIP and cosmetic-related head and neck surgery, including reconstruction surgery for breathing and skin cancer. After the operation, the anesthetic causes post-operative mobility and visual impairment. These patients generally leave the clinic by wheelchair. All of them require access to a ready vehicle for loading and unloading. And even if they're not in wheelchairs, the visual impairments could make crossing the road, even at a signalized intersection down the street, difficult. It's about 80 meters to transport a patient down the street. Then you'd have to cross and get to a parking spot on the other side of the street. For my client, this would make his business unviable and leave him no choice but to move from this neighborhood. And given that more Southside users are commercial rather than retail or or essential medical clinics, such as the physiotherapy clinic and others, they might make similar decisions. So if keeping parking on only one side of the street, keep it on the side that's more dependent on parking, the south side. In closing, the easy solution is to amend 2F and attachment 3 to retain the south side parking, and we urge you to do so or defer this item for further consultation. Subject to your questions, those are my submissions. Thank you. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, seeing none, thank you for your deputation. Our next speaker is L.E. Gotham Clements with Metropolitan Toronto Condominium Corporation number 795. Uh, Madam Chair. Hi, uh, thank members you. Of the uh, are you able to hear me? Thank you, we are, you have five minutes, thank you. Madam Chair and members of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee, our Condominium Corporation, MTCC 795, has made a written submission to this committee regarding a major safety concern we have with transportation services cycling infrastructure proposal in its present form. As well, I, as a member of our board of directors, have been asked to relate our concerns verbally to your committee. Our condominium building, consisting of 108 units, of which seven are commercial, including a dental clinic, which is just being established on the ground floor of our building, is situated on the south side of Davenport Road between Avenue Road and Hazelton Avenue. As a whole, we have a demographic of older residents. There are many vehicles that have to interact daily with our building, including numerous taxis and other ride-sharing vehicles for the many who don't drive, but require transportation to appointments, vehicles delivering groceries and goods for those who can't get to stores, wheel trans for those who require wheelchairs, ambulances, and so forth. The current proposal is that there be a bicycle lane adjacent to the sidewalk in front of our building with an uninterrupted mechanical barrier between this cycling lane and the vehicular traffic. This would mean that the vehicles I've just mentioned would be unable to access the curb in front of our building and would have to stop on the opposite side of the street, forcing elderly residents and those serving our condominium community to try to walk across Davenport Road which Transportation Services describes as a major arterial road with four lanes of busy traffic, including buses. The other likelihood, frankly, is that many of these vehicles will still stop in front of our building 
in a live traffic lane to deposit their passengers, creating a hazard for pedestrians, cyclists, and motor vehicles. What we suggest instead is that there be an opening in the barrier between the traffic and the cycling lane, just large enough to allow a vehicle to access the curb in front of our building in order to pick up or drop off a resident. That part of the curb could be designated a loading zone with no parking and the no parking strictly enforced. We feel this modification to the present proposal would better provide for the safety of our residents and those servicing our condominium community while still enhancing that of the cyclists. Of course, we would be open to other solutions that would resolve the safety concerns I've mentioned. The bottom line for us is that our 200 residents should have reasonable and safe access to their front door. I, in mentioning other solutions, of course, uh, the solution suggested by uh, the previous speaker uh, is one that would also resolve our problem. That is, if the uh, parking restriction applied to the north side uh, of Davenport Road and uh, motor vehicle parking were still allowed as it is presently uh, in front of our building on the south side of Davenport between Avenue Road and Hazleton. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, uh, seeing none, we'll move to our next deputant, which is Kevin Rupasing with Cycle Toronto. Hi, committee members, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. You have five minutes. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Chair, and uh, the rest of the committee. Um, while Cycle Toronto is supportive of the implementation of the 2021 proposed bikeways that are scheduled for upgrades to cycle tracks and the new bikeways that are, uh, will provide useful lo local connections, we would like to see more focus on growing the cycling network um, than on a plan that primarily serves to renew existing infrastructure. Uh, we are pleased about some of the cycling projects that are proposed outside of the core. For example, there's a protected bike lane proposed on Cummer Avenue, uh, proposed bike lane upgrades on Birmingham Street. Both of these are coming forward after extensive community consultation. Um, Thorncliffe Park Drive upgrades will be a win-win for the local community. The city is also focused on upgrading key cycling routes in the core, such as Davenport, uh, Harvard. Um, uh, those bike lanes will be upgraded. Um, on Gladstone Avenue, uh, a useful neighborhood connector will be introduced, and the improvements um, on Danforth Avenue uh, to the entrance to destination Danforth, uh, just west of Broadview Avenue, will make the crossing of an on-ramp that's very uncomfortable right now much more accessible for all ages and abilities. Um, I think while these projects are uh, important neighborhood connections, it's, it's what we would expect to see in just one part of a robust permanent cycling infrastructure rollout for, for the year. This is not a suitable rate of progress for a city that has embraced active transportation as it did in 2020. There's still vast areas of Scarborough and Etobicoke with no bike lanes at all, let alone a connected cycling network to provide people with mobility choices or even a complete street style transformation that would bring economic vibrancy and vitality for local businesses and residents alike. Just over two lane kilometers of new permanent bikeways per quarter as proposed uh, will not enable the City of Toronto to meet its Transform TO goals, its Vision Zero goals, um, certainly not its cycling network plan completion targets. In addition, the health and economic recovery goals that are recommended by our own Office of Recovery and Rebuilds report um, on COVID-19 impacts and opportunities, identified building bike lanes as a key factor in, in building up our economic resilience and uh, post-pandemic. So guaranteeing the long-term health and well-being of Torontonians, we cannot just rely on upgrades and temporary installations like through Active TO alone. We need to be investing in permanent, equitably distributed uh, growth to our cycling network. Um, and that includes community design and, and consultation. A rate of implementation, um, it, it's not keeping pace with the, the needs of people that are currently biking and the latent demand of people who would ride a bike if they could do so safely. Um, we're asking for, uh, you know, going forward um, to, to have an accelerated rate of implementation and to determine what resources transportation services need to implement its own plans to get there. Uh, there was mention of, of uh, the next phase of the cycling plan coming back in July. 
and it's a great opportunity um, to start looking at how we can do this quicker. The pandemic has highlighted many issues with Toronto's transportation infrastructure, and these need to be tackled in order for us to prepare for an equitable and just future that sees us through um, not only the public health emergencies, but the climate emergency as well that we're facing. And we're asking the city staff produce ambitious annual targets uh, for cycling infrastructure completion that align with achieving our road safety, uh, environmental health and equity goals um, the city council has already committed to. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kevin. Are there any questions of the deputant? Seeing none, we'll move to our final deputy on this item, Warren Chow. Okay, uh, Warren is not present, so that will take us to questions of staff. Um, outside councillors first, any questions? Into committee, questions. Councillor Layton, five minutes. Sorry, yes, thank you it looks very much. like uh, Councillor Robinson maybe just didn't get a hand up quick enough. Okay, sorry, Councillor Robinson, five minutes. Sorry, thank you. I'll just be one minute. I just want to make sure there was a mistake in the report, in the original report on um, related to the Thornclip Park Drive and the bus stops. I just want to ask staff if that was corrected because my understanding there was supposed to be a technical amendment, but um, uh, there isn't one according to the chair. So I want to make sure that that mistake was corrected about 12 bus stops on Thornclip Park Drive versus there's actually 14. So could I just get clarification on that? Uh, through the chair, yes, uh, Councillor Robinson, that has been corrected. Amazing. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. We'll go to Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. Um, just to the to the two deputations around um, the decision for the placement of parking along Davenport, both um, west of Avenue and east of Avenue, um, could could you comment on why? The, um, the 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 parking in those two locations were put on the north side rather than the south side. Uh, through the chair, the decision around the north side versus the south side was made in relation to where we could maximize the number of parking spaces maintained on the corridor, i.e. minimize the parking loss um, with consideration for where there are driveways and what the adjacent uses um, beside the that section of curb are. So it's possible that we could move the, um, the, the bike lane to the opposite side. It's just we would have a loss of parking. The section um, that the uh, representative from the um, medical office was speaking of would have a difference of 21 spaces on the north side is what's proposed here. And if it was moved to the south side, we anticipate it would be about 16 spaces. So about five additional spaces would be lost. Um, I understand the section that the gentleman was speaking about from the condominium would be a bigger impact on the proposal um, with a change of currently 29 spaces were retained on the north side, whereas we would only be able to retain six on the south side in that segment. Um, and so these things were considered as part of the design. We'd have to come back with some changes to the design and some changes to the re relevant bylaws, but Becky could speak further to that. Um, I think that's, I, I, I think that the, the point has been made about the decision and, and how we arrived at it. I'd just like to add, currently in front of the condominium entrance, there is a bike lane, correct? With a no stopping designation? That's correct. Becky, is there anything further you want to add on that? Correct. It is, a, it is curbside parking in some sections and then a, a regular unprotected bike lane. And how, how long has the bike lane been there? One of Toronto's first. It is quite quite old, and I actually, through the speaker, I do not have the decision history because it happened uh, before um, we um, got bylaws passed through council. So I actually don't know the exact date of uh, install. So currently, there's no permitted parking there, and it likely predates the the condominium. At the corner of Avenue Road, uh, there is no uh, parking. Further to the east, there is a few spaces that would be lost. Okay. Why are we upgrading the lane? Why, why did this get such a priority? Because it certainly, like, it didn't come from my office, but that, that that's fine. It, it came from staff. Why was it such a priority to upgrade this lane? Yes. Yeah. 
through the speakers. So in the 2019 cycling network plan, um, a variety of projects were um, identified to be renewed to today's cycling standards. Um, today, the bike lanes are uh, along a high volume, high speed road. Um, and are in the door zone. So if a, a driver is opening their door in the existing parking, it is into the bike lane. So this was identified at the time in 2019 through the near term cycling network plan to be to be upgraded for safety reasons um, to improve outcomes. I, I'd also like to note that Davenport has become a more important link as new additional cycling infrastructure has been built in the downtown core. Just quickly okay, to add to that, you. the Vision Zero plan uh, identifies the uh, the desire to reduce and eliminate um, serious collisions of vulnerable road users. And this corridor had 27 collisions that involved people walking or cycling um, in the last five years. Okay, thank you. Are there any additional questions of staff? I'm just waiting for the screen to change. Uh, Councillor Pasternak and five minutes and then we have to make the very important decision about lunch. Okay, Councillor Pasternak. I, I will be quick. Um, through you to staff, um, the report says that they're going to install, the, the plan is to install uh, 2.39, um, I guess, lanes of, kilometers of lanes. Um, and the, is that for the balance of the year or? Just it seems a little meek. I don't I'm trying to extrapolate where this fits in. Uh, through the chair, um, this is just the first quarter report of projects that have been consulted on with local communities um, and are, are ready to have their bylaws approved. Um, this comes in conjunction, obviously, with the recommendations in the report that you you've just uh, um, passed, and there will be further reports coming in Q2 with additional cycling infrastructure. So, is this, um, we'll be looking at uh, 9, 9.5, I guess if this is a quarterly report, are we looking at four times this or? Is it... um, some of the projects are still subject to further community consultation um, and, and obviously approval from council, uh, councillor, but we anticipate in the range of about 20 kilometers or so um, this year. Um, I just, I happen to know it's just sort of looking at these lists of things. I see Ward 11 a lot, um, Ward 10, 10, 11. Um, were there, were there any wards requesting a cycling infrastructure that were left off this list? Is this, um, or is this, are you pretty well meeting, meeting the current requests? Well, thanks for that question, Councillor. The, the the projects come through the near term cycling network plan, and um, and engagement um, follows those um, that overall plan. And we'll be updating the next near term plan in in July of 2019 to lay out projects for the next three years. Um, there certainly are requests um, from councillors for us to take on projects, and we're looking at where we can accommodate those in the next near term plan. Are are we on track? with our cycling plan? Um, we've identified some challenges with delivering the cycling plan for sure. Um, there, I, I wouldn't say we are as far along in the delivery of the plan as we anticipated, um, but we are we are actively working to um, to address the challenges that we're, we're encountering and, and reprogram uh, the delivery of the plan um, to meet uh, Council's uh, direction. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, just waiting for screens change. Okay, so we still have speakers on this item and then eight items on the agenda. So I will propose that we take a lunch break until 1.30. Great. Uh, Madam Chair. Yep. Oh, sorry, you're right. Speakers on this item. My apologies. Okay, 
Uh, all right, so we will reconvene at 1.30. I do ask, if possible, if you have motions to advance circulate um, to get those up, that will give us the opportunity to have a look at those and uh, run things smoothly when we return at 1.30. Okay, thank you.
Okay, we're live. Uh, so we are on item IE 20.15. We were just calling questions of staff. Are there any additional questions of staff on this item? Okay, anyone to speak on this item? Uh, Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. I, I believe Councillor Pasternak has a motion too that he'll, he's advanced circulated and, and I'd like to thank him for that because I think it's a worthwhile motion um, to make. Uh, you know, I think there's, there is a lot of work that's gone into um, even the handful of lines that we have or a handful of routes that we have here today. I think we need to um, just acknowledge that it's the first quarter update, that there's more work that's coming forward that's going to be done. I know I've got an item, uh, a, a, another lane within Ward 11 that uh, that will be coming in a future report. I hope it will um, as we've started the community dialogue already. You know, it takes a lot of work to move these projects forward. And, and it's unfortunate because we need to find ways to make it easier. Uh, we need to find ways to get infrastructure like this installed quicker because if we don't, we're not going to achieve our objectives under transform TO to, um, to move 80% of our local bike trips, our, our local um, uh, trips from cars to bikes or to walking. It's simply not going to happen. And that would be a huge shame because transportation is an enormous part of our existing greenhouse ga gas contribution. Um, that being said, I, I, I do believe that we should move forward with these um, with these pro projects as fast as we can, so we can move on to the next set of projects and um, and and continue uh, to transform the city and make it a safer place to be. Like it's not just about the one or two percent of people that are cycling now. And I was just joined by a, by maybe a future cyclist, but it's about having future cyclists be comfortable out there on the road. Um, because and this was totally unplanned, so my my apologies for using it as I as I'm going to. Um, we, we've lived in the city for a long time that it's been, it's felt very dangerous bringing our kids out on, uh, on, on bikes on our streets. And it shouldn't, you shouldn't have to own a car to get around our streets safely. Um, you shouldn't have to ride on side streets. That's not how people live their lives. Uh, to get to now, to get to the ROM or the art gallery or all the places you, or all the parks we go in our neighborhood with our kids to, to go to, over to the high park, you know, high park. Um, we've got separated and secure bike facilities. And that wasn't something I had growing up. Uh, and I think it's really important to acknowledge that we're doing this not for that one or 2% that currently use those bike lanes. We're doing it for the 20, 30, 40% of people that could use those bike lanes if we made them safe. Um, to the comments that were brought forward by the uh, by the two deputants along the Davenport Road. Davenport was a project that snuck up on me as well. Um, it got brought to my office late last year. Uh, we're happy to see it move forward because it is a very dangerous bike route and staff have acknowledged that. And, you know, in order for us to address um, address safety, there will be some disruptions. Uh, that's, the, that's the sad reality is we can't just add six more inches onto that road. And if we could to the width, then we might actually be able to make it less less disruptive. Um, we have, I have reached out to staff to see if there's anything that we can do along those two locations to try to address uh, the, the loading issues that were brought forward. I think in the case of the condominium, there may be actually a greater uh, opportunity because of how the road tapers there. Um, but I will do my very best in lead up to council to try to address those concerns um, uh, if, if we can. Um, but until then, I think we need to keep working on these projects and to Councillor Pasternak's motion, um, councillors across the city need to start doing the same, engaging their communities, uh, and, and trying to set up success for some of these projects. It doesn't just happen when staff send around a flyer. Um, you have to be engaging your communities, your BIAs, your residents associations about these projects, create that excitement for what they can bring to a neighbourhood. Uh, and in the case of many, many of our uh, communities uh, that, that are getting upgrades today, um, I, I'd like to thank them for, for the enthusiasm that, the, that, they've, that they've shown. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Layton and guest. Uh, we'll move to the next speaker, Councillor Pasternak. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I do have a motion, I want to put it on the screen, although it has been advanced circulated. The City Council 
Fiscal Director General to include metrics and goals as part of the July 2021 update to the cycling network plan that align the impl implementation rate of new cycling infrastructure with targets outlined in city policies, such as Transform TO, Vision Zero, or the Toronto Office of Recovery and Rebuild, Impacts and Opportunities Report. So what we need is we need to put these reports in context. And we want to know whether we're actually keeping with the uh, multi-year plan, capital cycling plan uh, that was adopted by council. Are we falling behind? Are we on schedule? Are we ahead of schedule? And I must admit, it is hard when you see a report like this that, that references 2.39 uh, kilometers of, of new bike lane, how we're doing uh, in relation to the plan we adopted uh, last year. So I think this motion will help with um, achieving goals, uh, measuring, uh, measuring where we're at, and of course, creating benchmarks um, so that we could see. It also links it importantly to other other city programs um, to make sure that um, we're aligning our city programs and they're not operating uh, in, in silos. Um, there's not much more to add to the cycling conversation. Uh, in some areas of the city, it works. In some areas of the city, it does not work. Um, no one is forcing anyone to give up their car and start riding a bike, uh, but, but where it's safe and where traffic can continue to flow it's an option that we can present. I mean, one of the reasons I was able to sell bike lanes on Wilmington and Fayetteville was I explained to people, particularly along Wilmington, that I've received a decade of complaints about speeding. And that by putting the bike lanes in, we were able to take some of the traffic flow and slow it down a bit. The other thing we were able to address is I get dozens of complaints every year about cyclists riding on the sidewalk. And this is particularly concerning um, for, for seniors. And one of the solutions is create, uh, create an on, on road option. Let's get the cyclists off the sidewalks and let's get them onto road when we can continue to support traffic flow, which includes police cars, uh, fire engines, uh, and of course, uh, ambulances. So um, I, I would thank staff for, for this report because it's important to keep us, keep us up to date, to give us a snapshot of what's, what's happening, at least on a small scale going forward, but we look forward to other iterations of the report and measurability on how we're doing on the overall plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any additional speakers on this item? Okay, we'll move to voting on the items. Um, Councillor Pasternak's motion. Okay, all those in favor? All those opposed? That item carried, or the motion carries. Uh, item as amended, all those in favor? All those opposed? That item carries as well. Uh, that brings us to 20.15, changes to community council delegations, author authorization of designated speed limit areas, 30 kilometers per hour on public lanes and roads and designation of reserve lane and speed. We have one deputant, uh, Jessica Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. You have I'm five here minutes. Again to oh, I'm here again to represent a group called Friends and Families for Safe Streets. We are a group of people who fight for road safety. None of us wanted to be advocates, but the role was thrust upon us because our loved ones were violently killed on Toronto's deadly streets or because our lives as we knew them were blown apart by severe life-altering injuries in a preventable crash. We advocate for the life-saving vision zero safety improvements that keep vulnerable road users safe. And we're here to commend the city on this report and express our support for its initiatives. As the report states, lowering motor vehicle speed is a key component of vision zero because when a driver crashes into a vulnerable road user at a lower speed, the person struck has a greater chance of surviving the crash. The difference between 30 kilometers an hour and 40 kilometers an hour might feel like nothing to the person driving, but it is everything to the person who's struck. 
the plan to lower speeds to the gold standard of 30 kilometers an hour on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis is a much more efficient method of implementation than the slow process of going street by street. Coupling this efficient speed reduction method with an expansion of the automated speed enforcement program would result in even better speed compliance. Having said that, we all know that a much more effective way to control driving speed is through changing the design of a street. Many drivers are perfectly comfortable ignoring the posted speed limit. Their driving speed is influenced by cues from the design speed of a street. For example, by how wide and how straight the lanes for cars are. So it is absolutely essential to follow speed limit changes with speed limiting design changes. This can be accomplished by many straightforward methods, such as narrowing the street to discourage speeding. And then if you've narrowed the street, in some cases, you'd have room to add a protected lane for active transportation to create a useful connected grid. Intersections can be made safer with interventions like curb bump outs and sharper turning radii or by building a protected intersection. Of course, we cannot allow the transportation department or this committee to overlook the fact that this measure still does not address the real beast in this room, the most dangerous streets that we have, the suburban arterial roads where pedestrians regularly get a death sentence for the perfectly innocent walk action of crossing a street on a green light. The five years of failure to achieve Vision Zero have clearly shown us that until Toronto's leaders come up with a political will to take substantial action on suburban arterials, we'll never reach our Vision Zero goals. Finally, we're also pleased to see the recommendation to designate Dufferin Street as a community safety zone. Such a designation would likely not have saved the life of Alex Amaro, who was struck and killed on Dufferin Street by not one, but two drivers on December 2nd, 2020. What would have saved Alex's life and spared her family and her community the unbearable, painful grief of her loss would have been the transformation of Dufferin into a complete street with protective infrastructure for vulnerable road users. While we appreciate this step for Dufferin Street and understand it would open the doors for reduced speed limits and automated speed enforcement, uh, it would not have protected Alex Amaro from the crash that killed her. So we feel it is important to always remind you members of this committee, a design overhaul is what is needed to prevent reckless inattentive drivers from inflicting such heartbreaking human carnage on Dufferin and on all of our arterial streets in the future. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation. Are there any questions of the deputant? Okay, thank you, Jessica. Are there any questions of staff? Okay. Um, Councillor Minim Wong and then Councillor Leighton. And then actually, if it's the will of the committee, do you mind if we move to the next item and hear from the deputants, just recognizing that they've been here a long time in that way, if they want to drop off the call and then we can come back, is that okay? Okay. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Also, oh, Madam Chair, sorry, you just got a promotion. It doesn't, uh, doesn't pay if, more, if so. I could, I, I, it doesn't, no. Uh, much more responsibility in sitting in that chair. Um, I, I was holding another item, but I've, I've discussed it with staff. I've got a bunch of questions and I don't think there's enough time to get to it today, but to forward it to council without recommendation, that way it doesn't slow it down. Um, I think staff are okay with that approach and it would give me a little bit of time to get some more answers. This is on point eight. Yeah, can you send that to the clerk to move after, we can move after the deputants? Yes, yeah. Oh, he has a okay. something. Yeah, he'll prepare it. Yeah. Um, okay. Madam Chair, I can release my two items if if it's the will of the committee. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll cover, I mean, it doesn't save it. I just want to save the, de the deputants first and then we'll come back through everything. So the next item will be 2017. Um, the first deputant is Ivana Stanek. Do we have Ivana online? Hello. Hi, thank you for joining us and for your patience. You have five minutes. Um, uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to speak today. And um, I have two objectives for speaking. Number one, uh, to get an understanding from members of the committee that I am not addressing an inconvenience or nuisance, but um, extreme noise from night work, winter work, that it's prohibiting um, many residents uh, 
living across from this uh, commercial plaza um, prohibited from speed. And number two, um, to seek and uh, hopefully get some resolution to the issue. Um, the subject of excessive and extreme noise uh, and ineffective wind noise described um, in a staff report as a nuisance is inaccurate. And it shows that the problem that we try to communicate is constantly and completely misunderstood. Uh, the fact that I was waken up today by the car alarms and the loud music of um, cars parked on a plaza, that I would consider a nuisance. But not being able, uh, the fact that the people uh, in the neighborhood cannot sleep during winter nights, often several nights in a row for um, the last couple of years, is not a nuisance, but a serious health concern that threatens our safety and mental and physical well-being. The noise that we experience is um, compared, uh, comparable to the noise generated by construction. I would like to stress um, again that um, the snow is removed always during deep night hours, usually starts one or two o'clock in the morning, and work lasts extremely long hours. For example, on February 14 of this year, three centimeters of snow that um, we received was being removed uh, on and off between 1 a.m. and 6 a.m. The city had not sent any plows, nothing was clean. The roads, city roads, and the plaza next day, you know, looked the same. Meanwhile, we didn't sleep between 1 and 6 o'clock in the morning. Um, we are not disputing the need to clean the snow away after snowfall. However, I've been, I lived here for 26 years and the first 20 years, we never had a problem and Plaza was clean in a reasonable amount of time. Now we have multiple drum tracks, excavators, uh, carrying the snow from one end of the Plaza to the next beeping, reversing and honking to coordinate the work. Um, it is no snow cleaning, but extreme and con uncontrollable loud, controllably loud work performed. This is what I, I don't know how to stress it more that, you know, this is what's the issue here. Also, I would like to point out that in the um, report um, that was sent by the city staff um, describing uh, and being concerned for the safety of people using the plaza. And I would like to point out that the very same people that you care um, are also the people that uh, we are the same people, the people that uh, hardworking frontline workers, um, that's the people that live in those houses. Uh, and uh, we cannot um, get a proper night's sleep and we have to work in a both difficult and responsible jo jobs. Um, mental alertness equals safety. There's a lot of elderly residents here dealing with uh, health issues and children attending school both need uh, sleep and um, not to function during the day. Um, we are not just spoiled residents that cannot put with inconvenience, but uh, we just simply want to sleep at night to be safe to ourselves and others. Also, in the city report, the staff mentioned the convenience of cleaning at night. And uh, I just would like to say that convenience of cleaning at night cannot and should not overshadow people's need for sleep. Um, the problem is also that even if the snow stops falling in the morning, it is not clean to the middle of the night. People use plaza during the day, evening, and accessibility does not seem to be the priority till again after midnight. So is it accessibility or convenience trumping our night's sleep? Um, Final thought, please. That's, oh, can I just wrap it up? Yes, please wrap up. 
question. Um, okay, so the last, uh, the question that I have um, is, what is the solution? We because the only solution I ever received from municipal standards licensing was to move, which I don't think so was appropriate. We ask to be restricted for six hours. That's as many hours we feel we need to sleep. And I would like to ask the members of the committee. Uh, how how many hours do you think people need to sleep on average? Because if we ask for six hours, there's still 11 hours for the plaza to move the snow. So, right. okay. Uh, thank you. Thank uh, you so much. <laughs> uh, thank you for your deputation. Councillor Pasternak, questions? Yeah, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, through you to the deputants. So you live, do you live on the, on the second floor of a plaza or not? or an apartment building near a plaza where you can hear this um, uh, during the night? Uh, okay, no, uh, we live uh, in a residential housing, uh, semi-detached that are located just across uh, Collector Road, Road, which is Barber Green. Uh, the issue is that those houses were built in the 50s um, and um, plaza, I think, was developed later on. Majority of the windows of our houses face the plaza. It's there are two story semi detached homes. The bedrooms are upstairs. So basically there is no um or we cannot find a refuge in the house to even go and sleep somewhere else in those nights that we cannot sleep. On occasion uh, when my son was in the university and had an exams we had to find another accommodations to make sure that he can have a proper sleep. But that just, I feel it's, um, should not be that way. So you have a, you have a cross arterial road from, from a plaza and it. The, the, the Barber Green is dividing and the residential and the plaza. Mm -hmm. I see. And, um, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, have you spoken to the plaza or you've just worked through municipal licensing? Uh, this is um, probably six years, five, six years process. We spoke numerous times on the plaza with the help of uh, Council Jay Robinson. Uh, we were numerous times residents trying to reach. Um, then I worked with uh, uh, Councillor uh, Minning Wong office. And at some point, the plaza's owner said that they will cooperate and at least they will not, because it's mostly not even snow plowing. It's just removing piles of snow from one end of the plaza to the next. And they agree that that's not necessary work to perform. I have um, emails from city council's uh, office from Jessica saying that, yes, um, they agree to cooperate, but after a few days, they just didn't respond at all and ignoring the issue altogether. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Any additional questions of the deputant? Okay, the final deputant for today is Monica Testolini. Monica, you have Hello? five minutes. Okay, hi, my name is Monica Testolini. And uh, as my neighbor mentioned, I live just next door to her in the same street, five Red Wing place. I've been living in my house for 40 years. We never had a problem with the plaza. The plaza existed until it was bought by um, a new owner. And I have the same problem. We just can't sleep. How is it possible to be clean from 12 o'clock until 4, 5 o'clock in the morning? The problem is they are using... Um, uh, Bobcat, which is a very small uh, utility to clear the snow. We we think if they use a large truck, like we see everywhere, that plaza can be plowed in less than an hour and will be done with. The driving us of our sleep is detrimental to our health and to our mental health and physical health as well. We tried to work with them. We did reach the plaza owner. There's no avail. Uh, our council also, uh, Denzel's office, reached to them many times. She will not return the call. And we don't know what's the solution. How can we be living in our house we can't sleep? 
we understand it, it is, it, the snow has to be removed. There's no question about that. But the hours and the length of the, removing the snow is excessive. And after they remove the snow, they come back scraping the ground. I don't know why they scrape the ground. We can hear it screeching. I don't know what they're removing. And as uh, my, my neighbor said, they, they remove the snow from one end to another end after they plow the snow. We just don't understand. How did we live in peace before? I've been here 40 years. We never had an issue. Why is the issue now? And what is the solution? We need to sleep. As simple as that. Thank you for allowing me to bring the issue to your attention. I hope that you are able to help us to solve this problem. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions of the deputants? Okay, uh, seeing none, I propose we run um, the quick releases Sorry, then. Madam Chair. Yep. I think we might be able to deal with this pretty quickly if I can just tell the committee why it's here and then um, we can move forward, um, okay. especially is, since it's fresh in everyone's mind. Is there any questions on this item? Okay, uh, speakers, and then we'll we'll run the agenda. Go ahead, Councillor. Uh, yeah, Deputy thanks. Mayor. Just for members of the committee, this is a kind of really frustrating arrangement where you've got this arrangement where you've got residential right next to commercial on one side of the street you've got commercial on the other side of the street you've got um you've got homes and what you have is a and we've been spending a lot of time in our office dealing trying to get these guys to be a little bit better neighbors when there's when the snow's falling but they come in in the middle of the night um and we asked municipal licensing what they could do and they said they couldn't do anything because the bylaw allows for it and the bylaw allows for it because the snow has to be cleared sometime and you can't do it in the middle of the day because there are cars in the there are cars in the parking lot. So it's an awkward situation. We asked municipal list licensing and standards to do something. They said they couldn't. I told the deputy the only thing they could do is change the law. So to come to committee. So they're here today telling us their problem and they're asking you know the city to change the law. And you have this report in front of you that you know doesn't recommend for this for the reasons outlined in the report. Um, this is kind of one of those awkward circumstances where we've got, you know, the guy, the guy across the street is trying to clear his snow late at night. Um, and some of the, re some of the residents are, are kind of, are being disturbed by this. I'm, I'm really not sure, you know, because I understand staff's position. I, I don't see um, a solution because I think if we don't, if we change the bylaw and restrict snow plowing between those those hours, then it becomes a lot more awkward for a lot more reasons. Um, so, you know, that's just a, if any members of the committee have any, you know, really great ideas on how to solve this problem, I'd like to find that solution, but um, I'm flummoxed because the owner of the property isn't being very sympathetic and the problem continues. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was talking without my mic on. Okay, great. I said seeing no additional questions, nobody else speaking, uh, speakers, I'm happy to move staff recommendations. The receipt, all those in favor? Opposed, that item carries. So we'll go back and run through the agenda item 20.8, amendment of blanket contract. Um, Councillor Layton, I know you have a motion to refer without Rex. Yes, I just I'd appreciate a little bit more time to get some information, um, but I don't want to slow down solid waste management on the item. Okay, we'll pull that up. Go ahead, Councillor Layton. That the Infrastructure Environment Committee forward this to the, to directly to City Council for that recommendation. It's waiting for the screen to change there, sorry. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed, uh, that's referred to council. Item 2010, I have a motion that was pre-circulated. Is there, if there's no questions or speakers on this item, we can move to it. Okay, I'll move. Sorry, which item are we on now? 2010, non-motorized craft. Oh, sure, yes. Okay, so if there's no questions or speakers, I'll just move that and then we can, um, staff can leave on this item. So. They'll pull it up.
the motion is for the general manager to consolidate opportunities and host a meeting with local councillors along the waterfront to review, get their input, and then report back on May 25th, 2021. All those in favor? All those opposed? Okay, that item carries. Uh, 2015, we're holding there was questions. Uh, 2018, uh, protecting and supporting frontline parks, forestry, recreation staff. I was prepared to move the recommendations of Councillor Kristen Wong Tam. They've been pre-circulated. If there's no questions, speakers. Okay, I'll move that item. All in favor? Okay, that item carries. Uh, IE 2019 request for review of work zone coordination consultation practices. Um, Councillor Pasternak is, uh, sorry, this one's Councillor Layton's. Uh, if there's no speakers or questions, Councillor Layton, would you like to move that? Please, thank you. Okay, we'll move to the vote. All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, so 2019 carries. Uh, IE 2020, Councillor Pasternak, um, is there any questions first of this or anyone to speak? Okay, Councillor Pasternak, you'd like to move your recommendation? I'll move the recommendation. Just wait for the screen to change. All those in favor? All those opposed, that item carries. Sorry, what item was that? I, my mic was off. 20, tw 2020. Okay, are we gonna go back to the delegated authority thing? Cause I had a question on that. Yeah, we're just doing the last one and then all the staff can leave for these items. The last one was 2021. If there's no questions or anyone to speak, um, Councillor Pashanak can move this motion. Uh, yes, yes, I'd be happy to uh, move it to have staff start working on a safety plan for the reopening of the Barry Zuckerman Amphitheater. Mm -hmm. Okay, all those in favor? All those opposed, that item carries. So that means the only item that is left now is resuming back on IE 2015, uh, the changes to community council delegations. There were questions of staff. Um, uh, Deputy Mayor, you have the floor. I mean, I was, there was a lot of kind of gymna gymnastics going on in terms of seeing what was being delegated and what wasn't being delegated. So I, I'm just wondering in the on local roads for 30 kilometers, that's not that still goes to community council, yes? Uh, through the chair, yes, that those do. The change here was that the Highway Traffic Act uh, changed and allowed us to designate a local road 30 kilometer zone by district as opposed to street by street. So we had flagged this back in the Vision Zero report, I think in 2019, but we didn't have the authority to go street by street. And uh, we, we only had the authority to go street by street. So now with the HTA changes, we have the authority to do districts and that's what we're proposing to move forward with. Sorry, you're gonna, you have the power, the authority to take, for example, North York district and make every local road 30 kilometers? No, no, sorry, sorry, Deputy Mayor, I, I, I wasn't clear. So district, not meaning a district of the city, but meaning like a, a pre, uh, an area that's likely local roads bounded by arterials. So within that area where they're all local roads and there's been an interest to reduce speed limits. Uh, that we could do it as a precinct and not have to mark it street by street by street. So if you were to take, for example, the Bayview Village community, someone, Councillor Carroll, who's the local councillor, could could move a motion to make the Bayview Village community all the local roads 30 kilometers. She could bring that through the community council. And we would look at the, the, the location and understand, you know, what, what made logical sense, because you have to alert the drivers. So typically it would be within an area bounded by arterial roads that was a local road, typically, you know, residential area. Is, uh, is there, I mean, this is a kind of a, could turn out to be a big thing because people just, you could have people ram through notices of motion, you know, without any community consultation. 
Is there a requirement within the, I could see that happening at council. Please make this area, please make that area, blah, blah, blah. You know, the whole, just, it'll go like wildfire. Um, is there any requirement for community consultation in making, you know, your so-called, uh, you know, small D district, um, changing everything to 30 kilometers? So we've actually prioritized them based on the number of serious collisions per ward. We've been working to try to identify these locations. Um, and uh, and I don't believe other than uh, sort of the general work that we've done on the report to bring this forward that we do specifically do community consultation with regard to speed limit reductions when they're safety related. So there's no requirement for, you know, that there that the, that all the residents in the area have to be notified. They, um, they certainly can, can come to community council, but, but they have no, to know, no they have to know that it's, they have to know that the items on the agenda. Right. I think that we, I'm pretty, uh, I'll, I'll, um, if, if any of my staff have more specific, uh, comments on how we actually do the notification. Um, but there's not currently a provision to require us to notify residents on speed reductions, which is the okay. same for vision zero across the board. It's my understanding. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Additional questions. Councilor Layton. Yes, just one question. And I think I, I, I think I asked this several years ago. Um, it seems to me it would be a little bit easier if we just reduced the speed limit all across the city and then um, increased it by using signs on major arterials or other roads. What is prohibiting us from doing that? So the, um, when the Highway Traffic Act changed uh, to allow us the ability to designate these areas, it did not give us the ability to look at a citywide speed limit reduction. Okay, thank you. Councilor Cole. Uh, yes, I had a question. Uh, I had uh, inquired about this uh, last year about uh, reducing the speed limit on one street to 30. Uh, and I was told I can't do that because of vision zero protocols. So does this allow uh, a uh, motion to come before North York Community Council to uh, reduce the speed limit of one street? Uh, from uh, let's say 40 to 30. Uh, to the chair, thanks, Councillor Cole. So um, it's still the same approach that we did for the provision zero. We're still implementing, first we started with the arterial street speed limit reductions, and then we went to the local road speed limit reductions. So certainly um, I mean, we're, we're prioritizing those both, both based on safety related issues. Um, we. Uh, we know that there are local conditions that um, councillors want to bring forward as, as looking at those local speed reductions. So this particular program won't actually be dealing with individual streets, but rather it will be looking at a, a group of streets bounded by arterials where we would be prioritizing for speed limit reduction based on uh, vision zero. I'm not sure so, if I answered your question 100%. No, yeah, no I, I, th I think you did. I just want to clarify okay. though. So if there's a uh, community, let's say Lawrence Heights, where we're doing that work to slow down the uh, drive by shooters there. Uh, so I could bring that forward as an area to reduce speed limits there. And that would still have to be based on your statistics. Um, uh, so certainly from just a, a straight speed limit and safety and uh, crash crash reduction perspective, uh, the area in Lawrence Heights, if it, if it uh, has some of those characteristics, we would have prioritized it for speed limit reduction. There are other um, approaches that we might take to local areas uh, that might include local traffic calming or um, some additional signage, et cetera, that would help to support local community needs and interest in that area. And so speed reduction may be part of that, but there might also be some other component pieces, which I think is the case with Lawrence Heights. But there could be a, a motion at North York Community Council to ask that speed limits be reduced to 30 kilometers per hour in the Lawrence Heights community, for instance. That could come to Community Council, then staff would report on it. 
So certainly you could bring a motion forward at community council. We will still be rolling these out based on safety related criteria as we've been doing since the beginning of the program. So what's so, yes, different? You could, so you could bring it forward. Uh, if it wasn't already in the prioritized list, you could bring it forward. Um, and, and we would implement it. Uh, we would do the analysis if it isn't already in the list and we would implement it as, as it came forward in the queue. But again, in certain locations, there might be um, there might be other extenuating circumstances that might require traffic calming or some other components that we would want to uh, that we would want to look at as well. And so that it might happen as a package of things is all I'm saying. So what are we doing differently here with this uh, motion we're passing? So because the HTA now allows us to do this on a multiple road area where we don't have to go through and sign every few, you know, uh, number of um, meters with speed limit reduction signs, we can put, we can identify uh, a group of roads, local roads, and we can actually mark the entryways to that area with speed reductions and put up uh, fewer signs, which means we'll be able to implement those speed reductions uh, in a more expedient fashion. The neighborhood approach okay, is what thank we're you. doing differently. Yeah, we got there. Okay, any additional, uh, Councillor Pasternak? Yeah, so uh, just to summarize, um, would we still have to, we'd have to bring a mo motion to staff to still study this, this cluster of streets and would it still have to meet the warrants to, to get your 30 kilometer an hour speed limit? Uh, yes, that is my, uh, no, so, so, um, you know, I'm going to have Jacqueline answer this question. I think that would make the most sense. Just take a second. Thanks for your, counsel, your question, Councillor. Um, so we are bringing forward all local streets across the city to community council in neighborhood clusters prioritized based on which ward has the most serious collisions within that area. But at the end of this program, all local streets will have been brought forward for a reduction to 30 kilometers an hour as per our Vision Zero 2.0 strategy. It's just which neighborhoods we do first that'll be prioritized. And the change here um, is that we're bringing it forward in a clustered way where the neighborhood would be signed as having a 30 kilometer zone on local streets with signage posted and pavement markings indicating that you're entering that zone with exceptions posted at higher speeds. Okay, so to summarize, we, we, we sort of skip the study part or we don't study that's, each of those streets in the grid. That's correct. We're changing the policy around what streets are allowed to be 30 kilometers an hour to make it that all local streets can be 30 kilometers an hour as we bring forward these neighborhood clusters through community council. Okay, all right, thanks very much. Okay, any additional questions of staff? Okay, move to speakers. Anyone to speak to the item? All right, um, Jennifer, can I just ask one question? Sure, we can go for a second round. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, can a neighborhood opt out? So, if you're, you know, gradually changing them, what happens if, if the neighbor's not interested? They think that 30 kilometers doesn't work for them and they'd like to remain the same. Um, through this through the chair, that decision would ultimately be of community council to make. So um, that could be brought forward when the community council motion is, is on the table. So they could say no the to the council and that could be adopted and just they could be left alone. Community council would be able to make that decision. Absolutely. Okay. That's delegate and it's delegated authority. So uh, that wouldn't go to council. No. Correct. It would be delegated to community council from council. There's no staff delegation involved. All right, thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay, uh, anyone to speak to the item? Okay, somebody like to move staff recommendations? I'll move staff, uh, Councillor Cole. Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, that item carries and I believe I am confirming that is the completion of the agenda. I have confirmed that with clerks. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a good day. care everybody be safe we'll speak soon happy motoring denzel <laughs>